Hey everybody, my name is Chris Gore from Film Threat. Welcome to our continuing coverage of the Sundance Film Festival 2022. Thank you for joining us. I have an all-star lineup of our Team Film Threat members here, writers from the dedicated and passionate Film Threat crew. Normally we would be in Park City, but today we're not. I am also at an undisclosed location. I'm gonna say I'm at an undisclosed kitchen. So if I sound a little different than my normal studio, because I'm not there right now. So uh, gather around. Please post your questions in the chat. We will address your questions and comments. And we're going to talk about the Sundance Film Festival 2022. Hey, we're back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alan, Sabina, Rob, thank you for joining me today. Uh, a lot of stuff happening. Rob, we were talking before before we started, and you had some some interesting observations. I countered those observations, but why, why don't you continue with what you were saying before no, we talk I about just, movies? I was just saying how how uh, I, I used to do a a little uh, uh, event for a film group that I that I work with here locally. And it was called the 7%. And it was about the number of women who directed major Hollywood films in the U S and that was, they only represented the 7%. So we wanted to highlight that, but it seems like every single major film I've seen this year has been, has been directed by a female. And I just think that's, it's been fantastic. I mean, I know that there, there's usually a larger representation, but not with a diversity that I've seen this year, all directed by females. And I just thought it was just a, a you know, there's a great crop coming out from this year. That's, that's, I mean, that's encouraging. That's, that's good to hear. Um, any other comments on, on that before we get on and start talking about movies? Yeah. I mean, I'll only add that. I, I'm not sure that I notice it more this year, but I think there have been efforts, uh, certainly in a lot of the film festivals I've gone to prior to the pandemic of, of making sure that women filmmakers are spotlighted. I think Dances with Films two years ago really hit it hard that, uh, that they wanted female filmmakers, people of color, directors. And um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think we're trying to find that equity there and I think we're getting pretty close to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a, uh more of a playing field for female filmmakers than there ever has been. There are more topics that they're closer to. For example, a film I just left about, um, about uh, sex trafficking that was done by, uh, it's the Palm Trees and Power Lines. And, th and it's a, a previous Sundance or a previous short filmmaker. And I think so some of these topics are seeing a bigger audience and I think Sundance allows for that and they work with filmmakers to have that happen. And it's part of their um, MO to do that. Um, and I also think too, that, um, you know, women are, have a little bit more of a voice than they have in the past few years. Um, we have a vice president who's, you know, a, a woman. I mean, we've got some right. stuff going on um, that helps it. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm fond of saying that, um, I, what, what do you call a, a, a female filmmaker or a, a woman director, director? It's just the director. Right. It's the yeah. position, right? I don't think it should matter. I think having been around the indie film world as long as I have, uh, I've always seen women filmmakers as part of the indie film scene. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's. I think the the blocker, you know, has always been Hollywood. It's it's not necessarily the indie film world. Just accepts whoever they don't care, right? Like mm -hmm. so, I feel like the indie film world. That's always been the case. Where it's new is is Hollywood, right? Like the success right. of filmmakers like Patty Jenkins. I So I personally really don't care. We're already getting some comments in. I just wanna say for those watching live, please post your comments, your questions. I'm gonna apologize about the, uh, the, the audio here. We've got, let's see, we've got the sound of one man laughing. Hello, film threat, Chris Allen. I'm gonna assume- Hey, one like, man. Oh. Uh, we also have funny girl. Hey, funny, funny girl. girl. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> greetings from Vienna in Austria. First time right. I the live stream from the beginning. Thank right. you, funny girl. Uh, you actually sound really good, Chris. So uh, yeah, I, I sound okay. Good. Okay, cool. Yeah, stop in the kitchen more stop. often. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's where I'll be. I love. To, I, 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 I honestly, I love to cook. I love to cook. I am very good at breakfast. I make a mean uh, uh, 
omelet. So there you go. I want to say before we get started real quick, support our work at Film Threat. Speaking of film, uh, 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 film Threat here, look, you can pick up this shirt. If you are Film Threatist AF, support our work. Seriously, uh, go pick up a Film Threat t-shirt. You can support us and buy something if you go to shop.filmthreat.com. Not just this shirt. There are many other types of Film Threat shirts. We've got hats. We've got uh, ski caps. We've got ball caps. We've got bags. We've got gaiters. We've got uh, all kinds of cool Film Threat stuff. This is what I'm sporting today, our Film Threatist AF shirt. So support us and buy something. We really appreciate it. Also, please like and subscribe. Share the Film Threat podcast. And uh, follow us. We're Film Threat on everything. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We actually, you know what? We have a TikTok now. So I have to change that. <laughs> we actually have a Film Threat TikTok that we just started. So this is our Sexy, quick. Yes. Yeah. Quick reminder before we Do get started. Do we have started. to start dancing now? <laughs> no. But you, if you've not seen the Film Threat TikTok, a couple of the videos have actually blown up. It's it's pretty cool. So, so check it out. But um, before we actually start, and we've got some more comments coming in. So, so thank thank you for those watching us live and posting your comments and questions. We're going to start talking about movies quickly, but before we do that, one quick topic because I've heard I've heard mixed reviews, and I think that that's okay. This is feedback, right? This is all new for us. Virtual film festivals are virtual festivals the future. There was mm. a little bit of a conversation online. Um, from some people, Slam Dance is doing it one way where you just pay $10 and you have access. It's sort of like buying a streaming service for a limited window, right? You've got a couple weeks to watch all the movies and that's it. Sundance is approaching it slightly differently. Sundance is saying, hey, you need to get individual tickets for each screening. There's a limited number of tickets. We're not going unlimited. And then you have a window of time. It's I believe it's five hours from when you begin watching right. to you know that window. I want to hear your feedback, and this is this is po feedback that can be um, a, a positive way to improve on the experience. I love the concept of a virtual festival. I hope that it doesn't go away. I mean, think about the the access this is that this opens up to with people worldwide, people who might, may not be able to afford to go to Sundance. Right? Hey, you can see a lot of these movies. There is no there's no barrier to entry. I I don't think the barrier should be limited tickets. I have a complaint about that. What are your individual criticisms about not just Sundance in particular, but other virtual uh, festival experiences that you've had? How can the experience improve? And once we get back to live in person festivals, which I can't wait, um, uh, how can virtual festivals be be an, in addition to a festival? And Alan, let's start with you. We'll go around the horn there. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm always for watching it in a theater. And uh, with a crowd in a darkened room with no distractions, um, I, I just I just hope that we never get used to the virtual festival. Um, you know, I, I think I was just talking to uh, to someone about this, but I, I feel like when I'm at the festival, I'm much more cognizant of my time and my schedule and the need to go out and get to that screening versus with the virtual. It's like I find myself missing screenings. I find myself not uh, as aware of you know what I need to see next, and uh, and I think, you know, and I, I don't think people really want to do this. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a nice big TV, but it's still not the same thing. Yeah, um, uh, Rob, and then we'll go to Sabina. Yeah, nothing beats in person. And, and in fact, Sabina and I were, were just chatting a little bit beforehand that 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 community that it builds, that mm -hmm. that foundational community that a film festival builds and the conversations that emerge holistically from those. I mean, you cannot duplicate that. You can't you, you can't do it in a virtual setting like Alan. I missed a screening, too, because it was just it just fell off my radar. And I wouldn't if I was running from place to place at a festival. I would say that, you know, the, the five hour li limited window is nonsense. It, it's, it's, you know, it's obligatory. There's no reason for it to, to have, you know, to have any rhyme or reason to it. Now, if they wanted to do, I think one way that might enhance it would be a virtual watch party where at least you can have those people watch it at the same time and then communicate with each other immediately afterwards. So it's not the same, but at least you would have some of that conversation between members. That's my suggestion. Yeah, yeah. I agree with everything that you all say. Um, 
there is this idea that film festivals needed another platform to keep itself growing, to appease to a broader audience that can attend, like Chris said. Um, Alan, absolutely. Like my schedule is, oh, well, I'll stop that and then I'll start this and I'll, I'll, you know, you know, so-and-so can come over and watch it with me. Oh, wait, they're late. Wait, I have to, I mean, it's, it's nuts. Like you, 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 you can't program yourself in the house all day long or wherever. Um, and when you're at a festival, that build up, that excitement, that flutter that got us all addicted to this in the first place, you know, it, it's gone. And I did speak to a rather large publicist recently for an article who who's like, I want to cry with other people. I want to feel a human connection. And even if I don't know these people, we're all there with a, a, a purpose. And theater owners feel the same way, especially indie film owners. And, you know, and lastly, it's it's overwhelming to have all these choices virtually. Um, and so I agree, like a watch party with people who are committed, people bail, they come back. It's, it's, it's a bit much. Well, I'll, I'll say um, just to go off of what you said, Sabina, I agree. I think this whole five hour window thing is ridiculous. You're looking at if a festival is, is virtual, someone in, in, uh, in, in London is on a different time zone right than here. It's really, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, this five hour shortened window. I think that um, what you were saying, Rob and, and Sabina, um, makes so much sense. Like a watch party is such a great, we do watch parties at Film Thread. If you go on our YouTube channel, you'll see there's a playlist. We just did a watch party for The Spine of Night. Uh, we did a watch party for the United States of Insanity, the ICP documentary about their fight, uh, uh, you know, uh, being labeled a gang. Like these watch parties are fun. It's participatory. It's you're, you're engaging. I mean, it's like, if that's the best you can do virtual, great. We can participate together, but maybe a window of here's when the, the, you know, watch party is, and maybe even a post screening like, discussion between the people who attended. Exactly. So we can all chat. I mean, here we're chatting with people. I have no idea where they are, right? Well, there's someone here from Austria. Like, this is great. But like they started the conversation this. with us. They're the ones who started and we we feed off of that. Exactly. But maybe like a 72 hour window to watch it. And then here's the window when the most people will be watching it. And then then you can get audience participation because that's the nothing beats that energy in the room. I mean, if you've been at Sundance, and I've been fortunate to see so many so many um, Sundance classics, like I saw Napoleon Dynamite first screening at the Eccles, right? And there's the whole cast. And yeah. like, it's just like, th that cannot be repeated. That is not a virtual thing that like, or the, just the energy, the Q and A and just like, and you know, like that you, you can feel it. You can feel when a movie is just connecting with an audience. I think part of the reason for that is that these movies are untainted by marketing, right? Like, mm -hmm. Here's this paragraph description, which doesn't even tell me what the movie's about. And you see it with no trailers, one still and three sentences, you know, and, 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 and well, I'm just going to trust the programmers that they know what they're doing. And, you know, often they do. Right. So that I think really, really has a lot to do with the experience. And Nick Jones says United States of Insanity was great at a Fathom event. Yes, that actually they did a one day event where that, that film played. And if you want, there is a watch party on the Film Threat YouTube channel. So so check that out. So uh, yeah, and it's just some other comments here. The only film festival I visited is in the town I live in. This is from Funny Girl. And often I only watched one during the festival, but observed all the movies presented, listening to the feedbacks and watch, watch them later. Yeah. It's, yeah let, me, uh, let me talk about that real quick. Yeah, uh, sure. You know, if, if Sundance, South by Tribeca, Toronto, they go virtual. What's that going to do to the local film festival? Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. feel like if if the big guys are going to go and go do it all virtually, I think it's going to crush these small film festivals I, and, and fear that the most. Disagree, disagree, because the local film festival isn't for you. It's for the locals. It really is. Ultimately, I ran a, a, a festival that was considered the Sonoma Valley Film Festival in the early 2000s. I was the program director there. And it was for locals. I mean, very few people flew in from out of town. A couple people flew in because it's the wine country. It's a vacation destination. But I think that, again, you can't go to a winery virtually. I mean, maybe you can order a bottle of wine from a winery and watch a movie, but you know, you can't repeat that experience. Rob, you were about to say. Chris, that might be some, but I know, I know of a lot of film festivals. In fact, the one that I was working with that I started here 
has actually succumbed to this whole, you know, bigger mentality of just getting these bigger mainstream slash independent films there in order to survive and, and to perpetuate years of, of usage at the festival. And, you know, they are, I believe, like what Alan was saying, is they're going to be crushed. They are not for, a lot of these locals aren't for locals anymore. They are simply just mere duplications of what you see at, at Sundance and Slamdance and all those popular titles so that they can they can be seen by those in that community but yeah. you know, a lot of these had to kind of retrofit the their programming so that they can get lots of butts in seats yeah you know? and to add to that um when you bring in a star or someone notable that that gets everybody riled up to go see them especially in yeah. small town vacation resort areas i think in a city um, there's a little bit more going on with a film festival because you have so many options of what you can do and where you can go see films. Um, I think you have to be highly creative and, and, and incentivize people to come. Um, but again, I go back to, there's nothing wrong with the virtual platform being a part of a film festival though. I, I think having both is, is good. Um, and I, but I think, we're not going to be able to go on with this much longer. <laughs> no, I agree. Wait a sec. I, I need to stop. We have a four ninety nine dollars super chat Nick. from Nick Jones. <laughs> Nick Jones is comment about United States of Insanity. I know Nick. Great guy. Next time you're out in LA, Nick, we are going to hang out. I know, I know we are. So uh, awesome. Thank you, Nick. Uh, no comment there, but we do appreciate the super chats. Uh, helps us do what we do. So thank you for that. Here was his comment previously, which was about the United States of Insanity, a great documentary, by the way, directed by Tom Putnam, who, a uh, fun fact, was an intern for me in the 90s at oh, Film Trap right. Magazine. We were in print, awesome. who is now an established and very accomplished filmmaker whose movie, uh, The Dark Divide, um, is uh, starring David Cross, a fantastic film. So uh, thank you, Nick, for that super chat. Love it. Uh, support Film Threat, y'all. I've got a few shirts. Thanks. Yeah, Thank we you. have the best shirts. Yeah, I, yeah. I got to say, we got the best <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Back to this topic. Um, what do I mean? Like, look, I actually love the virtual festival aspect. I hope it continues. I think this is a good thing. Having said that, there we, we have to get back to, I mean, the one thing we discussed when we were talking about should Sundance move you know, to a spring or summer date, you know, it's such a beautiful area. They could do outdoor screenings. They could host outdoor screenings, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I've seen it at a lot of festivals in summer locations or uh, during summertime. Talk about West though, with, with you know, it doesn't get dark till so much later in the day. So I, you know. nothing's good. I'll still be there. Make yeah. it, you know, <laughs> come on, just yeah. let's, let's, it is. Let's, That's let's, always been what I, my complaint is with, with events trying to host an outdoor um, a screening in Idaho or Utah or wherever is so that got to wait till 10 o'clock and people are like, eh. Not you if know. you do it in the winter. The winter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> done that too. But, there you know. go. But, <laughs> uh, we're going to be, we've got a special guest that's going to be joining us at the, um, near the end of the podcast. We're probably going to go about 90 minutes, maybe two hours or so. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I do have a special guest that'll be joining us, but I know that like Rob, you're on limited time, um, because, because you, you have to catch screenings. I've got to catch, got yeah. my five hour window. It's yeah. ticking. I'm in between two. So I, I'm I really fast. I know there's a screening going on right now that I want to be at, but uh, I'm with you guys and I appreciate and I'm, I want to be. <laughs> Well, we're going to certainly so Aubrey talk, be damned. <laughs> we're going to be talking about more topics as we continue our discussion, but let's get to our first movie. Alan, what is our first film that we're going to be talking about? Yes. Hey, uh, let's uh this is one we missed last time, but uh, let's talk about Master. This is a uh, Regina King. Uh okay. I think Rob you reviewed that. I did. I did. Uh Regina King stars and is a producer of it. Uh it was the director, um, Mariama Diallo, uh, first time director, a, a, amazing uh, atmosphere that she's created. Essentially, it tells the story of three uh, African-American women who are at this like prestigious Ivy League college that's in the South um, or New England. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, she is uh, Regina King plays a, the first master of a resident hall there. Uh, then we also focus on another uh, young lady, uh, Zoe Renee, 
um, is the actress who's like this wide eyed freshman and one of the few black students on campus. And then there's another um, uh, professor there, uh, Amber Gray, who is uh, up for tenure, um, but she has a very, very thin publishing past. So and and then it takes on like these supernatural elements of uh, when when she first arrives onto campus, she learns that her uh, that her room was uh, haunted because someone hung themselves in there. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of supernatural elements around there. Uh, Regina Hall's character finds like all these tchotchkes from from its racist past all around the house that she's moved into. Um, a lot of the horror movie tropes of like insect infestation and, uh, you know, creepy noises and stuff kind of flood the halls and, and, um, and all of them have their own kind of uh, separate narrative storylines, but they do, they do mesh together. Um, I, I'll say that, the that, it probably bit off a little more than it could chew because a lot of the thread lines, it, it just kind of leaves. So it works better as a drama than it does a supernatural horror. That said, it is a testament to, to good lighting. Um, the, the it's, you know, and color grading, you no, never appreciate it until you see it done well. And she has this master balance of, of light and shadow that is just perfect for the setting because it not only does it, you know, kind of go along with the dichotomy of the school itself of the racist past, um, but it also leaves like all the, the background elements. There's just enough shadows that are going, you know, that, that something could be lurking in those shadows around the main characters. And that adds to the suspense to it. I mean, do you feel like that, uh, social issues tend to lessen the impact of the horror. I mean, that's the that's the feeling I'm starting to get. Uh, it's like, you know, I just want to be scared. I just want to have thrills. Yeah, but, it, it's uh, not one to be scared. Um, and, and I think, I think, you know, the like the whole Salem witch trials. I think that's it's it's interesting, but it never explores that as deeply as it should. Um, you know, it never uh, it never comes to a to a satisfying conclusion for all of the characters involved, but it does have very provocative questions that it asks. And, and again, I think given a more uh, a cohesive linear script, I, I think she is, she is apt to, to do some amazing things, a director. I mean, they are, because like I said, she knows how to frame, she knows how to light a set. She knows how to, to build that suspense. I just don't think she knows what to do with it. Once that suspense is built. Hmm. And don't, right. isn't, there, isn't there a review on the website? Did I notice on filmthreat.com? I think that's either out now or it, yeah, it was posted it's out now or it's coming out real soon. We get yeah. to the point where we, we can't even keep track. Like, oh. like, sometimes we've had days where like 20 reviews post in one day because yeah. we're also trying to cover the shorts. So, um, it, and also there, there are, I know some, some VR projects and I, you know, I would, I, I, I wish, you know, that's one of those things that's like really hard to, you know, not all of us have, like, I have like the old school Oculus. I don't know if it works, but yeah, I, yeah. I'd love for us to be able to cover more of that in the future. I know. That's there, something there's... you could talk about as a topic too in the future, Chris, because I tried mm -hmm. getting on that and tried, you know, walking through the, the one of the, one of the uh, presentations that they had there and mm -hmm. I couldn't get to my seat. My seat was like right over there and I couldn't move. I was trying with these, you know, <laughs> Stupid, like regular glasses. Nothing worked. Awesome. So. <laughs> yeah, I got to do the VR uh, VR segment at Sundance when when we had Sundance last, and mm. uh, I, I, it was really interesting. I, I just question whether it really can be a viable form of storytelling, but but maybe we just haven't interacted with it enough. Well, right? I will say this: I, I don't question it at all. I've I've had the having had the Oculus VR. I think that like we can talk about this in more detail later, but um, you know. I, I've seen movies in VR. Like I've seen cartoons. Mm -hmm. It's it's really incredible it's cool. how, how, how it looks. So uh, I, I think it is the future. I don't think it's there because I don't think it's like, we don't have all like one format, right? There are many different types of Oculus glasses. You can even use your, um, 
you know, you can you you can use your phone and you can just put it up to your yeah, face. Yeah. It's, the, it's the Blu-ray <laughs> HD DVD yeah, yeah. argument of the <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like once we get to a more for, a format that's formalized, and then we'll all be plugged into the matrix. But yeah. um, yeah. a yeah. discussion but it's also figuring out how to exploit the technology, and that's that's ultimately it's, the, it's the all right there. there. It's it all is. right there. It's it's really sort of the imagination of, I believe, a next generation of filmmakers that grew up on gaming, probably gaming more of a focus than than film. I mean, I grew up in the, you know, the, the film age. I think that now you've got the most popular form right now is storytelling via video games. I mean, that's it. When you mm -hmm. look at money, it dwarfs Hollywood. It dwarfs everything. Video games, that's that's where it's all at, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's so weird to see a generation that's like, watching movies or television is like third, fourth, or even lower on their list of activities. That's, it's just the way it is. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'm not going to be old yeah. man yelling at cloud, but that's the way it is. Yeah. And for, you know, VR has other purposes too. Like I've worked on film festivals where you walk through a refugee camp with VR and you are like, Oh my gosh, you have no idea what's going on. Or like it, the state of Utah will throw it out there when we were actually in person, like come check out our state and our land. And, you know, so it's got its purpose all over the place, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, I just wish there was more of it. I wish it was more accessible. I do. We, just need, we just need it to be inexpensive and standardized. Yeah. Format, and we're not there. And it's not, I even have the PlayStation VR, which is great. Yeah. One of the games, yeah. and I, I forget the name of the game. I'll we'll talk about it some maybe our next discussion. Um, but in one of these games, you're basically in a Quentin Tarantino movie. You know, you wake up and you are tied to a chair. Hopefully, there's a the gimp. Well, no, not that. <laughs> okay, thankfully not that. You're, you're tied <laughs> to a chair. You're being interrogated by some mob boss because you're involved in some crime, and it's it's awesome. There's gunplay. There's all sorts right. of stuff. That's it's, that, uh, it's like in its eighth generation. I know that game. Um, yeah. I think you go to the hospital, you drive a taxi, make some money. Yeah, yeah. it's something like that. I'll, I'll get yeah. the actual name. But um, look, if you are a filmmaker, you want us to cover your work, uh, whether you have a movie playing at a film festival, or you're just releasing it on your own, go to filmthreat.com slash contact um, and, and we'll tell you details. Or you can just go to filmthreat.com. There's a little button that says submit your movie. You can submit it. We will review anything. We'll review anything. This is just my my thing out there to filmmakers. Like, how do you reach the film threat crew? Right here. That's it. You just go to the contact right there, or you go to submit your movie, and and that's that's all you got to do. We well, once to we get an Oculus reader, we can now accept VR films. So no, I mean, well, actually, I mean, at some point we do need to make that as a category because yeah. more and more of that work. There's a there's a Facebook group that's that really uh, promotes that. But all I'm saying is, you don't need a highfalutin publicist that you pay money for if you want to reach the film threat crew. Right there, that's how you do it to, to get us to review your movies. Um, Alan, what is our next movie up for All review? All right, well, <laughs> hey, let's uh, let's get away from controversy and talk about Nothing Compares. <laughs> 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 nothing controversial about this movie. Nothing at all. Um, I'm going to make it quick because I, I definitely am in the middle of some screenings, but um, Nothing Compares is one of several biopics I've seen so far, and it's about Sinead O'Connor, and basically, it's a testament to her lasting time. Unfortunately, her son just committed suicide. So it, it's not the best time for this film for her. But um, she's a tough lady. She was way ahead of her time. She was trying to tell people what was going on in the Catholic Church. And, um, and they wouldn't listen. And the world didn't care. They ripped her to shreds, is what I said um, in the review. And um, I... You know, she's one of those women who who kind of no one understood because they didn't understand her and, and what she was going through. And her music, especially Nothing Compares, probably the highest rated music video of all time. Um, and um, and although she put out maybe six or seven albums, um, her her message is what she was really all about. Um, and so the filmmaker. Um, who's also from Belfast, you know, just wanted to do this in honor of her. To, she's not in the film, actually, in any interview, and you don't see her today until the very end, um, where she's singing a song of gratitude, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And um, she still has a shaved head, um, a little bit more covered up than ever. Um, but there's nothing more to that film than that, you know, this is a, about a musician, a, a, a big star who was at the top of her world and fell from grace. And the public 
some some many didn't care for her they wrecked her they threw her out she left and now in today's world we know what's going on with the catholic church there's abortion is legal in ireland and it has its place and um and if you like Sinead o'connor's music you're going to want to watch the film now one thing is is that the her song is not part of the film because prince wrote it and the estate wouldn't let it be uh, part of the film so you get a couple bars of it that's it yeah yeah still going on yeah. stuff is still you know still does going. she does she rip up the picture of the pope oh right? yeah oh that's a huge yeah. deal oh yeah that's they oh, show yeah. the whole you can't episode. have you can't yeah. have a documentary without that no yeah. no and she's in acapella singing a bob marley song and yeah. nobody even got it then you know but it's they amazing got to think of the career she would have had had it not been for that you know the longevity that she probably would have been able to you know, to, she would have been like another Natalie Merchant or another uh, Bjork where she could continue this this legend that she's created before that fall. You, you know, get the sense that if she had done it today, her career would have launched because of that. Yep. But because of I the time you know, it happened. I don't know. I think that she is so, was so on top of her own grief and abuse and that's where this all comes from she had a very abusive mother the very irish um very set in their ways and the music helped her survive and i don't think she cared if the public wanted it or not this is her calling and she stuck to it and i think that that says a lot about an artist like herself and i think that's why this film was made is because she she didn't give up she didn't care she took it she took it on the chin I'm um, curious, Sabina, have you seen the the Britney Spears documentary that they did too? I haven't seen that one. I'd like uh, to see that. I'm just wondering how it compares because you see this like reckoning that we've we've had with the mm -hmm. way that the press has treated these people in the past and through the lens of today, realizing just what damage and destruction was done back then. Yeah. And well, I'll go back to the premise of our conversations. That's why an independent film festival is so important. You get to see the whole deal. You get to dive deep. You can make up your own mind. You can decide to support it or not. Um, and, and I feel like, I don't know if Sinead wants to do a comeback or not. I know Brittany, I think, does. Um, but you got to you gotta give them some credit. They And again, this is like the Princess Di film. These people thrusted themselves into the public or they were put in the public and they dealt. And how it came out and how it turned out is is what happened but how they survived beyond that is right. the better story i think um i don't know i mean that's like but there's a lot of that going on at sundance biopics because one i think a pandemic made everybody go to the archives because they couldn't shoot in person or they couldn't get there so and i've always thought you know if you're going to make a movie and you really don't have any material go to an archive there's so much sitting there so we didn't film school you know, when all else fails and the film jammed in the camera, you went to the archives. So, um, but there's a lot. Um, and the same goes for the Lucy and Desi film, you know, the archival footage, the audio sound, it's all in the same way. And that was a lot of the Sinead film was audio, a ton of her speaking over, not seeing her. It, it reminds me of uh, the, the, the Belushi documentary. You mm -hmm. know, the Belushi documentary was made and it's 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 all um arc it's all archival video footage mm -hmm. and it's audio of Jim Belushi's widow or excuse, John Belushi's widow interviewing people who knew um John back then Lauren Michaels Dan Aykroyd Carrie Fisher even and they were audio cassettes mm -hmm. so this whole, whole thing was archival all the interviews in in the Belushi documentary but which I believe was on Showtime mm -hmm. um, was all done from interviews that she did about her 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 you know deceased husband it was it's it's i mean just knowing that adds a whole other layer that these are older interviews those are all the interviews and uh, it's a really fantastic doc i i personally love archival documentaries it's sort of a subgenre of docs or, mm -hmm. or at least a way to tell that story there i mean you certainly could do new interviews but i really love archival docs so i'll tell you um, i've never seen so many maxell cassette tapes and films like i have this year <laughs> <laughs> no but this is a cool it's it's amazing because it. you really you really have to sit, sift through um, to 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 get the story, we we're getting some more comments. Um, uh, the sound of one man laughing says, "Love listening to the reviews." And then also, 
Uh, did you all like the Lucy Desi movie? I think that yeah. might. Segue. I think we'll talk about that soon. Yeah, we'll yeah. talk about that soon. And yeah, funny that'll be says, one of our films. So yeah. Funny Girl says, "Great conversation. I enjoy that." Yeah. What's our next? What's our next interview, Alan? Okay, so, so I'll take I'll take the next one. Uh, it's my old school. This is, um, you know, what I the thing I love about film festivals is uh, I love not knowing what I'm getting myself into. I, I look, I read that little blurb. Sounds kind of interesting. Okay, I'll dive in. This one, I, I looked it up. There's Alan coming on the uh, in the big picture there, and so I'm thinking this is a comedy, but this is actually a documentary um, that stars Alan Cumming as the uh, as the figure of the uh, as the subject of the documentary. Um, it's about this kid named Brandon Lee who uh, goes to who enrolls in a prep school in uh, in Glasgow, Scotland, called Be Beersden Academy, and um, he, so he's kind of a late enrollment. He he walks in and he's noticeable because he's in full school uniform. He's tall. He's lanky. He he doesn't like look like the other kids, but he's he's definitely noticeable. But but probably nerd is the best way to describe him. Uh, so he goes in. He uh, kind of keeps to himself. But you find out as classes go on that he's this genius. He knows everything about uh, medicine and the human anatomy. Um, at one point, he um, he there in English class. They're talking about death of a salesman, and he has this great depth and insight about death of a salesman. So much so that uh, the school, the the drama teachers, insist that he audition for um, for their production of South Pacific. Uh, he takes the role of um, oh, I forgot the name of it's not the Frenchman, but it's the uh, the other guy he who sings younger than springtime. He gets the role. He uh, performs it. Everyone, you know, loves his performance. He soon quickly becomes the uh, the most popular kid in school. His best friend is the only black student at that school, and and because of association, the 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 jock who had been bullying him all semester uh, is now his friend. So he's kind of uniting people, and um, he's just this charismatic guy. And then all of a sudden, you realize uh, the truth comes out. Uh, this guy is not who he says he is um uh, and i will i i don't know how much to spoil but think of uh the movie never been kissed um i'll just say that yeah the brandon winds it's up drew being, barrymore yeah with drew barrymore <laughs> no uh, Brand, uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit but brandon winds up being this 30 year old man uh who went back to school and uh, not only did he go back to school, he went back to the school that he went to when he was in high school, and he was taught by taught the second time by the same teachers who taught him the first time. And um, and so now what unravels is who is this guy? Why is he doing what he's doing? And and the story just really unravels in this weird way. And one thing to point out is Brandon didn't do it, or that's not his real name even. Um, <laughs> but he. Uh, he he did it for reasons that you wouldn't expect. Like he's not a pedophile, he's not a predator. Um, but the reason why he did it, and then the beauty of this documentary is the fact that um, not only is Brandon in the movie, um, and and I'll say it this way: um, Alan Cummings, Brandon didn't want to wanted to be in the movie, but he didn't want his face in the movie. So Alan Cummings, who was supposed to play him in a in a dramatic version of that movie of the story in a movie several years ago plays him now lip syncs his audio interview and then and then plays his does his younger voice in the animations all these reenactments aside from that um they the filmmaker went to the school was a uh, classmate of brandon and he was able to gather at least 12 other students and they just talk about the story and then they talk about revealing when they found out what happened. And then at the third act, they piece together what Brandon was thinking and what he was doing and how, how he was able to get into school and pull off what he did. And it's just this really fascinating story of a guy who pulled something incredible off. And then to think back and, and kind of, you know, piece it together and figure out, well, wow, this is, this is a bigger story than anyone had ever imagined. Wow. Wow, Alan, that sounds. I, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry you ruined a little bit of it, but it sounds yeah. so cool. Yeah, I, well, I, I, mean, I only, I only teased a little bit of it. There's, oh, it, don't tell it gets, it gets more incredible. Yeah, oh, no, no, the joy it sounds really movie, good. 
the joy of this movie is just watching it, uh, watching everything reveal. I, I liken it to last year's Misha and the Wolves mm. because you just don't know what's what's going to be revealed next. It's not as yeah. dark as that, but it's just as impactful. Cool. Wow, that is awesome. Uh, rrr, mm, says hi everyone. Hey, hey R -M. Hey, R -M. Good to chat. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, rrr, mm, is uh, a, a, a renowned commentator on other YouTube channels. <laughs> um, no, I'm serious. Uh, Midnight's Edge, uh, among others. So happy to see you there. Often see her on on Rob Burnett's late night show. Uh, cause I'm, I don't know. I'm addicted to YouTube live streams. What can I say? Uh, we have now being joined by, uh, Norman Gidney is here and I know yeah, Rob, you have so limited sorry, time. So, late, so Rob, you have limited time. So I know we want to make sure to get everybody's reviews before they have to go. So maybe Rob should go next. What's our next review, Alan? Let's see. Oh, um, well, Rob, do you want to do dual or do you want to do is it Brian and Charles? Duel and hatching are oh, actually hatching. they're quite oh, similar. So yeah, either let's, one. let's do let's do hatching because I think that's getting kind of the buzz right now. Yeah, let's do it back to back too. So let let we'll do it yeah, we back sure. to back, Rob. So okay. uh, you're so we'll up. Start with well, actually, let's uh, let's start with duel and then we'll end on hatching. Okay, sounds good. Is that is that good? Okay, cool. Sorry. Yeah. No. We'll do, no, it's no, a no progression it's here. Okay. So, uh, Duel is uh, directed by uh, the same gentleman, um, Riley Stearns, I believe is how you pronounce his name, the director of uh, 2019's kind of uh, Infant Horrible, uh, The Art of Self Defense uh, with Jesse Eisenberg, who we spoke about last time. Uh, and I think your mileage of, of Duel will will vary dependent upon how you felt about uh, art of self-defense uh, because he seems to be creating his own cinematic universe where everyone talks as though they are uh, cardboard cutouts. Uh, they have this like really strange stilted speech to them. Everything's very flat, very monotone. Um, and this one stars uh, Karen Gillan, who, um, uh, who is a young lady who is diagnosed uh, with a, a incredibly rare condition in which uh, she has a almost 100% chance that she will be dying soon. Uh, she, she receives the news and has delivered the news like very flatly, very monotone. Um, and while the doctor is telling her this, uh, she says, oh, and by the way, here is a pamphlet from a company called Replacement. And with a simple swab of a Q-tip, uh, we can uh, produce a clone of you so that your loved ones won't grieve and they'll go on to live the rest of your life, even though it's going to be cut short. So she decides to do that. Fine. And then we have this kind of, she plays a dual role in it. Karen Gillan plays a dual role where she is also her clone. Her clone, uh, then she kind of imprints on her and, you know, gives her all of her favorite recipes, sexual positions, so on and so forth, telling her all these things so that she will be carried on. Um, and then, um, you know, she she's getting everything prepared and ready. Smash cut to 10 months later. She's still alive. She's somehow beaten the odds uh, and she is still alive and is now in full remission. The doctor says, oh, you're clear to go, and you probably want to decommission your clone. Well, part of the uh, little byline in there, the contract, was that uh, if a clone decides that it's not does not want to be decommissioned, then uh, the only way to settle this is in uh, uh, a televised duel to the death. The other, I know the homonymic, uh, yes. Duel to the death that is, uh, you know, very popular with people where you go and battle your own clone. <laughs> um, so uh, she decides to seek the help of a uh, of a self-defense um, uh, professional. And uh, she's a little short on cash cash. So she gets this this cut rate one. And that's Aaron Paul's character uh, and uh, his his self-defense. Uh, techniques involve like slow motion reenactments with cardboard knives and uh, <laughs> watching really shitty eighties horror movies. Um, and because so she can get used to the violence and, and yeah, the, I, I don't want to go on past that because okay. it'll spoil anything. But you know, if, if all of this sounds like it is like, you know, just 
right in your wheelhouse, then then this will continue to feed that beast. You um, had me if, a death match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this is such a cool concept, Rob. I mean, this is to me what I think indie film needs to go in the in the in this kind of direction. Of I mean, it sounds like a Black Mirror episode. It's it's so yeah. bizarre. And we should mention because some people are listening. Uh, deleted scenes. We have some we have some comments here. Deleted scenes says listening. Listening from listening in from the road. We should mention that dual is spelled D U A L. It's dual, but so, it is homonymic in that it is also a dual D U E L. Exactly. It, it's it, yeah, dual meaning, dual meaning for dual, right? Yeah, like <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, this is yeah. Rrm says dual sounds like my kind of film. Like I do. I like that. It's it's like this low budget sci fi, right? Because I assume it's not low fi sci fi. Lo-fi sci-fi, I really love and leaning into that. Like, like I mean, really good sci-fi. If you look at like old Twilight Zones from like the fifties, right? Like that. It, it's all about ideas. It's an exploration yeah. of ideas, and this this explores that. And I love Karen Gillan, by the way. I mean, she's so great. You know, in the, um, I mean, she's awesome in the Marvel movies and whatnot. Like, exactly. she's fantastic. Yeah, and so I, that's the only the only issue I had with it is that you have. Not only do you have one, but you get two Karen Gillans for the price of one, and you have her playing a character that is very monotone and robotic, and and it's just like, oh man, I really wanted to see, and I get it, like that's his style, that's his like Wes Anderson, you know, tick to have all his characters speak that way. But I just I wanted to see more from her and Aaron Paul together, and uh, yes, it's silly, it's off the wall, it's bizarre, it raises a lot of questions, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't even attempt to answer any of them. It just brings up a lot of these subject matters. Well, it's, it's um, you, you've added it to my list of something that, that I'll want to <laughs> see. Wow. Thanks, Rob. That's great. Um, it, just a quick reminder, if I could let everybody know while you're watching the live stream here, uh, support Film Threat, pick up, Pick up a Film Threat t-shirt. You can go to shop.filmthreat.com. These, um, I'm, I'm fond of saying these movies, these uh, are, are stuff, you know, they, they cure nudity on contact. This is one of the things, we don't talk about this enough about the Film Threat t-shirts. They cure nudity on contact. I'm wearing a shirt. We're all thankful for that right now. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Film Threatist AF is the shirt that I'm wearing right now. So, so uh, support Film Threat, throw us a super chat. Or, or whatnot. We have a uh, we have a quick question here from Chad, which before we get to our next review, we'll answer. Chad P. Crawford says, "Film Fest question for a screenwriter: Is it better to enter screenwriting competitions or film it with little to no budget?" Uh, I'll say this for myself: screenwriting competitions are fine. I think you might actually be better off um, uh, just getting getting notes from a reader. Uh, paying a reader to give you notes is probably a better investment for your money. So rather than a competition, which I think is, you know, good luck with that. I, I think your money is better spent on a professional uh, reader who can give you notes to help you make a better, uh, do a better screenplay. As for shooting a film with little to no budget. Yes, absolutely. I always encourage that. I think that I, I, I think it's best not to dive in and say, well, I'm going to make a feature. I think it I think it's better to do something like, hey, I'm going to make a five minute short. If you can make something compelling at five minutes, you can make something compelling at 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then you work your way up to your first 90 minute feature. So my recommendations is set aside the screenwriting competitions, get it to a reader. Now, after you've been through a reader a couple of times and you're getting really good notes and good feedback, maybe you consider a competition, but um, I, I, th that that's where I stand on it. Any other comments from anyone else well, on, on Chad's yeah. question? Thank you for your question, Chad. And feel free to throw us a super chat. Normally for something <laughs> as detailed as that, you would throw a super chat, but I'm going to let this one slide. That's your first, <laughs> yeah. that's your first freebie, Chad. That's a freebie. But, but go so, ahead. So the question, opinion on this? The question I have is, does Hollywood care that you won a screenwriting competition? Does Hollywood care that your script won a competition? And, and the answer that I get is no. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you can, you can say it, you, you know, great job. I, I have a friend who has won multiple screenwriting competitions and, uh, and it pains me that, that none of them have ever gone further than that. And, and I feel like that's the value of a screenwriting competition. 
it's like your GPA. It, you know, C's get degrees. So just to move past that and move on directly to it, like, like Chris was saying, if you have a five, 10 minutes that you can condense it, because a good story is a good story. And it will, it, you know, we overlook as, as reviewers, I know I'll overlook a ton of shortcomings elsewhere. If the story is solid, if I know that I can emotionally connect with somebody in there, then, then all, all the rest will fall by the wayside and, and you can forgive a lot. Sabina, you've worked at film festivals. What, what's your what's your uh, what, what's your feedback? So um, it's interesting. You know, they always way back when they said, you know, go to a festival with a screenplay in your pocket and see how you could do. And now that there seems to be competition aside from the film festivals, um, I, Rob and I have gone back and forth. I, you know, helping start the Sun Valley Film Festival, they actually do a live read a, a, a scene in a in a script and cut, bring it to life with actors. Uh, Jay Duplass was there, who did it one year. And that works as a live performance. You actually see people who know their craft and art, and it kind of puts them on the spot. Are they really an actor or not? Um, and a director. And so that kind of scenario, people will pay money for to go see. And, and people will uh, enter those competitions. Um, you know, I totally agree, Chris, get someone to read your script, get the notes, someone in the business. <clears throat> if there's one thing I can say that I have an issue with right now with films, and this may be the virtual world, they're so freaking long. And I know that script was not that long, you know, it's not industry standard. So, you know, let that, I don't know how that fits, but like, it is getting on my nerves to spend two hours watching something when it should have just been 90 minutes. Like, and there's standard, there has to be, it's a business. You know, what is it? A, 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 a minute of film is a page of your script. You know, the, the, these things have been around for a long time. Um, and so you have to understand when you write a script that like it better be in its 50th version, cleaned up, ready to roll. People don't have time. And that's my point. Um, do it. Do it. You know, just don't throw it out there and think you've got the greatest thing. You don't. Um, and someone's already told your story half the time. Um, maybe not in VR, though. <laughs> right. Well, this is, I think this is really good feedback. So Chad, I, I hope we helped you out. This would make a good individual video too, um, Alan. What's our, what's our next review, Alan? What, All what, right. are, we, what are we talking about? All right. Norm just joined us. So, Hey Norm, talk to us about honk for Actually, Jesus, save your soul. What? I thought we were going to let Rob go. Cause he had to bounce. Did you need to bounce Rob? I, that's all right. I, I can, I can hang out. That's fine. Remember, okay. I have a five-hour window, so I can move it just a little. <laughs> that Overton window, I can shift a little bit. Cool, cool. And well, this uh, is our, wait a second. Before you start, this is our second person from Austria. What right is on. going on? Hey, thank, hey, you, hey. thank you, uh, thank you, Loom TV from Austria. And uh, apologies, Nor Norman Gidney, who is one of my all-time favorite humans oh. from Film Threat, who also, well, he writes for Film Threat, but he's from Horror Buzz. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Norm. Um and uh, I'm just happy. Norm is so fun to hang out at a hang out with at a real film festival. When we're in person, Norm is your guy, uh, Captain Party. So, um, <laughs> no, sorry, Norm. I, mean, I learned it from you. I yes, I learned it from watching you. Um, <laughs> no, no, seriously. Like you know, Chris was the guy who convinced me to go to Sundance, and it was like okay. And then I jumped in, and within a few days, it was like. I got this, you know, and I was setting up lunches and running around. Anyway, so, okay. Okay, okay. Enough of that. Um, but, uh, yes, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul uh, is a, is part faux documentary, part uh, movie about a, it, the first couple of a disgraced megachurch in Atlanta that are in the midst of trying to uh, recover from a scandal. Now, at first, you kind of don't know what it is, and it's them just, um, you know, talking to the camera. You know, like, you know, all a modern family where you know they're they're talking to the camera and they're doing these interviews and there's things happening. But then they have the different aspect ratio for real life, and th you know, you see kind of behind the scenes and what the cameras are not supposed to see. And um, it's funny as hell. It's, it is so funny. Um, and what I, what I really liked was this was, um, 
this was written and directed by Adama Ibo based on a short that uh, she and her sister did. And um, it stars Regina Hall as the first lady of this big Baptist church. Um, and she's just, she's amazing. She's, she is so funny in this movie. Um, the links, the links that she goes to, to save her position and the amount of times she's like trying to coach her, her husband in, there's one moment where they're having an argument about how to say amen or amen. And, um, <laughs> another, <laughs> it's like, it's just, you know, and then there's another moment where they're kind of, it, the the big the big buildup is that they're trying to get ready for um, a big Easter Sunday return. So, you know that's that's the goal, and you know they're they're doing this little rehearsal in in the church, um, this this cavernous church, um, and I'm 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 stalling a lot. Sorry, and uh, there's a little girl there that's going to be part of the fun and. Um, after they go through this whole healing rehearsal and everything like that, the little girl looks at the camera and is like, I love theater. And I mean, it was, you know, it was just so, it was bitter and, and funny and also, you know, kind of sad. Uh, there's a lovely scene where uh, Regina Hall runs in a, into one of her former congregants and uh, the, the term bless your heart is used. Now, if anybody knows anything, that's that's not a good thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's 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 a hmm. So, um, yeah, it's 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 it was funny. It was I will say it ran. It ran a little long, like Sabina was saying. I mean, it 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 ran a little long and really had no idea where it was supposed to end. Um, which is sad. But uh, mm -hmm. the, the ride was great. And it was very Christopher Guest, very. Um, Norm, I'm getting know. righteous gemstone vibes. Is that. Uh, I don't know what that is. Sorry. Okay. It's a series on HBO, <laughs> Danny McBride, who uh, this is his second season. Uh, John oh. Goodman, Danny McBride, their disgraced mega church family. And got, it, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, kind of like that, I I guess, but but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's a hoot, and and I loved it. So, well, you and yeah. I have talked a lot about religion. Do you think I would like this movie? <laughs> oh yeah, all yeah, right, absolutely. Um, I totally want to see not, this thing. It's nothing. It's it's you know, it's if you like Book of Mormon, <laughs> um, but <laughs> because Book of Mormon doesn't really Sold. Book of Mormon doesn't really uh, shame religion so much as poke fun at it, even though it is just as awful as can be. Um, and this one is nowhere near as bad as that, but uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make fun of religion like that. So. Yeah. No, I definitely want to see this one. Yeah. Uh, Ditto. All well, right. Uh, another reminder, support us and buy something. Shop.filmthread. This is, you know what? This episode is sponsored by shop.filmthreat.com. Uh, Alan, what's our next review? And All right. Review. Let's, uh, uh, someone asked it earlier. Let's talk about it. Let's talk uh, Lucy and Desi. Sure. That'd be Sabina. Yeah. Um, so another biopic. Um, this was directed by Amy Poehler and um, Lucy uh, Arnaz, the daughter um, of Lucy and Desi. And I don't know how many of you grew up with I Love Lucy, Lucille Ball. Um, I did. Loved she, it. you know, a place in my heart always. She was a badass woman. She, um, her type of comedy um, was action comedy, acting comedy. She wasn't delivering jokes. She was performing. Um, and she and Desi broke some serious ground on how television operated in Hollywood with Desi Lu Studios and then buying RKO and then Desi and his brilliant mind, you know, had live filming going on, which no one had done in front of an audience. Um, and then he actually ended up taking over many television shows. So he was kind of a ruler 
of the errors. It showed their whole history, their whole romance. There's so much archival stuff on these guys. Um, and they kept it all. And here we go again with the Maxell cassettes. Only I think these were more like Sony's. Um, lots of taped audio by Lucille and Desi having conversations. And it was really quite amazing to hear her voice off camera, not acting. Um, and uh, classic episodes, Stomping Grapes, Club Babalu, um, the whole deal. They did a tiny bit on uh, when they thought that Lucy was a communist and that was the whole ep the whole show that um, is the new uh, the new uh, show that's on uh, HBO the Ricardo's. No, Prime, no, it's Prime. Amazon, Prime. Amazon Prime Amazon Prime yeah Amazon Prime. Um, with uh, Nicole Kidman um, I'm not a fan of that I did watch I wasn't I didn't love it because when I, I see when I saw this I was like oh so miscasted um, so I just felt like ah oh, brought her back to who she is and and how powerful. And then, you know, they had a long, long life and they had kids and they made money. They all supported their families, brought everyone to Hollywood, the whole deal. Um, strong, tough, um, smart on top of their, but it killed them in the end. Uh, Desi um, overworked. Um, he definitely had some alcoholism going on. Who knows what they were doing extramarily, but they did divorce. They all remarried, but they still all loved each other and they still worked with each other, which is amazing for that time in life and um it was sad because i think because we all had such a closeness to them as kids and our parents and family watching that show or maybe grandparents listening to on the radio um and watching her career um it just it just uh i don't know i just i felt sad i'm like where are those great prominent people today i don't know if they can exist um the only thing i can that i thought was weird about the the documentary was that I lost my sense of time in it because a lot of it happened in a quite a short period of time when Desi Lu Studios was so profound and and took over and I I kind of I kind of got lost in it and I felt like um, Amy Poehler and um, Lucy um, Arnaz were quite became quite good friends and maybe lost sort of the idea of what they were putting out there and it kind of got close to them in a way. So not that that's a bad thing, but you could, I listened to the Q and A and I could tell like it was more about their friendship than it was what they put in the film or why things were there. Um, and which was a great because Lucy was so close to it, her, the daughter, um, I don't know what happened with the son. Um, there wasn't much about that. Um, and yeah, it was again, the biopic, that seems to be all over Sundance. Um, well, Sabina, can I ask you? Because I, I actually saw the Being the Ricardos movie on Amazon yeah. and quite enjoyed it. I mean, I like Nicole Kidman and I grew up watching I Love Lucy when I was a kid. So I loved the show, including the show from the 70s. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, single, oh, oh. single women. Yeah. And, and while Nicole Kidman may have been miscast, J.K. Simmons was perfect as oh Fred. Oh, my God. But he was amazing. The high-waisted pants was oh, great. Was yeah. oh, but, but my preference always with any topic like this, I always look at a topic like that, and they'll make a biopic, and I always say to myself, I'd rather see the doc. Mm -hmm. since, since you've seen both, I'm just going to assume the doc is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. what you want. It's what you wanted. It's who they are. It's them. Um, right. not, and I give it, Nicole Kimmon talks about how a struggle it was to play that role. It was a mm. big deal for her. Um, mm. It's just that she took it so seriously that I, the comedy, I, I don't, you know, like, I think Lucy was funny on and off camera and you don't right. get that in the, in the being the Ricardos. Um, mm. Benicio, who, who did the, who played? Javier Bardem. Yeah, he was phenomenal. And he is, he captured Desi Arnaz and he was an amazing person and such a forward thinker. Um, and again, these people came from nothing. They had nothing. They were broke and look what they created. And, and the lasting effects of it is so, it's just so inspiring. Um, and I hope that's what people can understand. Like people worked hard and they, they say it, they worked so hard in the Hollywood system, but they loved it. They loved it. And the sound of one man laughing says Star Trek, thanks to Desilu Studios. Mm -hmm. There would be no Star Trek today if not if not for uh, Lucy Ricardo. Like she championed that. She was all about 
She was all about that. And oh, Sound yeah. Women Laughing also says thanks, uh, gal and guys. So there you are. <laughs> didn't, we, we, yeah. didn't Desi Lou do Mission Impossible too? Or, or um, am I mistaken? May, maybe. I know they did like That Girl and they did My Three Sons and they did um, the, the, the the Gomer Pyle stuff and uh, Andy Griffith show. I mean, a lot of people came wow. out of these shows that are, are time you know who wow. rule hollywood um so he mm -hmm. he knew what he was doing and he hired all the right people too um and yeah and that, and i think that being the ricardos is kind of nice to see the inner workings of how all that went where this documentary just shows you the two-dimensional side um so it is kind of nice to watch them both but you do see a difference uh and and uh, funny girl says yes they did yeah possible. so <laughs> There you go. You you are correct. Oh, right. so we have two people in the chat. The sound of one man laughing also confirming uh, Mission Impossible, so was, important. Yeah. which is great. So let's. Uh, I know that some of us are on limited time. We're going to be doing this live yeah. stream for a while. I have a special guest joining us in about thirty minutes, which is Dan Mervish from the Slam Dance Film Festival, who has also been going to Park City for. Uh, uh, since the 90s, like I have. So um, I know Dan will have a lot to say to add to the conversation, but I want to get through all of these reviews. So yeah. Alan, what's our next review? All right, let's go to Rob. And this is, this is a movie that I've been seeing on Twitter being talked about, and it's yeah. uh, The Hatching. Yeah. Hatching. So oh, hatching. It's just hatching. Just hatching. Speaking of Amy Poehler, who was a voice in Inside Out, this was like an upside down version of Inside Out. Um, it covers a tween girl who, uh, it, it's from Finland, a uh, tween girl who is, uh, she is a gymnast. Uh, her mom is a vlogger who, who represents this, who, who perpetuates this mythical, beautiful life that she lives. Meanwhile, we know there's something darker underneath and it's evident within the first scene where she's kind of going around the room with her uh, with her camera, and and everyone everything is perfectly appointed. You know the everything was just polished to a T. And then a bird, bird flies in. This bird flies in, starts wrecking the place, knocks over a vase, what have you. And the mother captures it, and the little girl Tina is sitting there watching her, and she's like, "Oh, let's let it outside." And the mother just just cracks its neck. And she says, puts this in the waste bin. So the little girl puts it in the waste bin. She goes to check on it and it's gone later. She finds it in the woods and she decides to dispose of it herself to put it out of its misery because it's still hurting. Um, and then she discovers an egg that it was, uh, that it had made its way back to. So Tina feeling guilt ridden decides to take this ed egg back, puts it in her bed and says, I'll take care of you. I'll look after you. And within a day or two, this thing is like sofa cushion size. This this egg has grown. And then uh, it starts to hatch. Uh, it looks like a velociraptor from uh, Jurassic Park. It begins to take on human qualities. It begins to mutate and then mutilate. Um, and it dispenses of like a neighborhood dog and starts causing all this destruction. Meanwhile, it continually more morphs into human qualities so it starts to get blonde hair like the little <laughs> oh, we're losing you rob yeah. oh rob becomes a doppelganger <laughs> for this little girl oh oh uh -oh. you're back did you get me yeah we 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 lost you for like the last okay, sorry. uh sorry last thing you said yeah you want to repeat okay, the last thing so it, it begins yeah, it, it begins to mutate and take on the form of this little girl. So it, it has human limbs. It gets blonde hair. It starts to shed its feathery body and then becomes more flesh. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, all these things under that are taking place, like this seedy things, like the mom's carrying on an extramarital affair. Uh, you know, it goes and... and um, <laughs> It's got a, uh, a neighborhood dog that is uh, that gets mutilated by this this creature that the little girl has this unspoken bond with it. And and they're still connected. And and uh, anyway, it's uh, it's it's like duel, um, but it also takes place in about that really awkward tweener stage um, showing the duality of and, and the expectations of what 
what females, young females are supposed to be like versus what they really feel. Uh, it's a wonderful allegory. It's, it's dark. It's not necessarily scary, but the, the, the practical effects, which they use for most of it are outstanding. I mean, this thing is horrifying looking. It's got this beak with human teeth and it's <laughs> drooly and it's nasty. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, talons become like fingers. And I mean, it's, it's really, really disturbing. It's got some really horrific, uh, uh, scenes to it. Um, but it is more, it's, I, I keep thinking of, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Yorgos, um, um, the one who did dog tooth and, um, uh, shoot anyway. Um, it, it it's, it's very Finnish <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's wonderfully dark and darkly comedic. And the, the, the little girl, Tina in it, uh, Siri Solalina is amazing. She is incredible. She's got to be all of like 11, 12 years old, but she carries on a dual performance as well in it. And she is outstanding. It is exactly what Sundance is supposed to be. This is a true midnight movie. And I'll, I'll be shocked if it doesn't pick up a huge cult audience. Chris, are you muted? Yeah, I was, I was going to say it's, it's on the, it's on the front page of film threat right now. We should, Alan, we should make sure in addition to the Chiron that we put the, you know, if it's on film threat, let's, let's feature it. But yeah. this still, I saw it this morning, um, your review and I saw this still and I was like, Oh my God, I can't wait for the <laughs> review of this movie. Cause I know it's going to be something special yeah. and, and something weird. And that's, that's definitely in my wheelhouse. So this um, is why I love independent film uh, festivals because of films just like this. You're not, wow. not going to see this on the multiplex. Oh, that's great. Well, let's let's make sure, Alan, in addition to the Chiron, that we throw up a, a you know, if it's on the front page of Film Threat, if we can yeah. feature it, or just go to the review itself. I should mention if you're if you're watching or listening to this, go to filmthreat.com. All these reviews and these movies we're talking about, there are written reviews on the website in more detail. Some include links, and you can you can even click on there's a little thing you can click on. You can just look at everything we've we've reviewed from Sundance 2022 so far on the Film Threat website, or stick with us with the with the live stream. Uh, who who's up next? Okay, who's that up would next? Be me. I'm gonna bow out. See you all. Take care. Oh, yeah. oh, oh Rob. Oh, take care, man. And we'll see you on some future live streams, hopefully later this week. Sounds awesome. Take all care. Right, take care. Bye, Bye. Rob. Bye. 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 Did you want to go through any comments before we go on, or? Uh, uh, let's right see. We'll look at we'll look at some. I, I think I went through most of the comments. I really appreciate okay. Sound of One Man Laughing for sticking with us. Loom TV, Funny Girl. We have people from Austria listening to us. Chad P. Crawford had a great question um, uh, earlier, so thank you. Rrm is here as well, so thank you, Chat, for for uh, you know participating. This is not just you know us as a group talking to you this is this is an interactive experience so uh, we appreciate your your comments and your questions and super chats if you're if you're able we we do appreciate that it helps us continue to do what we do so alan you're up next right did yeah. you say let's yes. let's get you let's get you up there alan All you're right. in the center seats uh, okay, Resident so, yeah so we had two movies from regina hall this is one from uh, rebecca hall uh, it's called Resurrection. And uh, first of all, I got to say, I love Tim Roth, but he's uh, all he's doing is our douchebag roles. Uh, <laughs> I, every single movie he's in now, he's just this utter douchebag. And, and that's not diff no different than here in Resurrection. Um, in the movie stars Rebecca Hall. Uh, she's a uh, single mother who's a, a, a pharma executive, very uh, established in her career, uh, has a really good life. And then one day she's at a conference and she sees David, who's played by Tim Roth, and she just freaks out. And uh, and then uh, when she returns to the conference, she's at the park and there he is again. And so uh, this guy, uh, basically long ago, they were once married. They had a, a child together, a little baby boy. And um, and the, the movie is about unraveling the mystery of why is she so freaked out by this guy? And... Um, you know, it's not your typical kind of uh, stalker thriller in the sense that it really, the story takes place from uh, the moment she sees David for the first time 
And then we watch her kind of spiral out of control as she has to deal with this guy who is, you know, passive aggressively, um, you know, uh, and re-entering his her life. And uh, we find out that uh, when they were together, that he was he 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 was grooming her to a very extreme degree, uh, to the point where he had control over her. And um, when they had the baby, and something horrible happened to that baby. She left the picture, uh, snuck off to America, and now he's found her. And um, and so we see it all from her perspective as she you know, goes to the police and tries to get help, and there's no help there. And then she tries, you know, she's so concerned about her daughter that she now becomes overly protective of her daughter, saying that she can't leave the house until this situation is resolved. Uh, and then she, and then there's the eventual encounter with Tim Roth's character, and um, and just this spiral, and it it uh, it just gets crazier and crazier. the The ending, uh, if you've seen Titan, it's it's very much like that. And then there's a moment at the end that's that's kind of Nightmare Alley ish as well. But but I think what's different about this movie is there's no, it's not your typical thriller in the sense that there's no chase scene. Uh, there's no uh, torture porn going on. Uh, it's just the effects that this man had in her life long ago and how it affects her now and how it kind of spirals out of control. And so much of the performances are, much of the movie are, is is on the performances of Rebecca Hall and Tim Roth. And so it's very much an, an actor's piece here. And it just, they do a really good job just, you know, considering that most of the movie is conversations and talking, they do a great job of just building that tension and just building it and building it to the end. Yeah. It, it, you may, you mentioned nightmare alley. I love that film. I think it's one of the most underrated movies of last year. And I haven't seen the black and white version in a theater. I'm dying to, yeah. but any comparison to that, I think it's, I think that the movie's just fantastic. Yeah. Have you seen it? It's that final moment that yes. is replicated here as well. Oh, God, don't, well, don't, I, okay. You've yeah. given away too much already. <laughs> That's well, awesome. you know, I actually reviewed that for Horror Bows, uh, Resurrection, and I I am crazy about Rebecca Hall. I think she's so talented. And this one, as you said, you know, it, it hinged on the uh, talent of the actors, and she carried that film. Um, yeah. Incidentally, this wasn't, wasn't it, uh, wasn't the screenplay also blacklisted? Um, oh, I have no idea. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think the the director. It was speaking of competitions, um, uh, <laughs> screenplay competitions. The uh, you know the screenplay I believe was blacklisted, and then eventually you know, and Rebecca Hall read it and was like crazy about it, and then that she also exec executive produced. So. Hmm. Let's um real quick before we get to our next review, the sound of one man laughing has an interesting question. Um, if you want to answer on this stream, why do so many people spend so much time con commenting on Disney, Marvel, Star Wars products that they do not like? Uh, I have an answer for that. Actually, I will answer that question, and that's because it gets a lot of clicks. If you look at the Film Threat YouTube channel, you'll notice we've got like twenty-five thousand plus subscribers currently. You'll look at all the videos and we get like, you know, a couple hundred, you know, uh, clicks or, you know, views or, you know, some of our videos do blow up to like a few thousand, which we do appreciate. Uh, but talking about Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar and whatnot, that gets a lot of attention. It's the thing that most normal people, normies, as they're called, the mainstream, it's it's a lot of people know about it. So it's, a, it's, it's a point of reference. Everyone can discuss it. I also think that all of those brands are on the decline. And I think that there, there are a lot of people very dissatisfied with something they grew up loving, whether it be Marvel comics like myself or star Wars. I also grew up with that. I'm sure everyone here has some experience with Disney, Marvel, star Wars at all. You know, we've, we've all had some experience with it. So it's a single point of reference and we've now seen these brands kind of decline where they are, in my opinion, um, catering towards a small percentage of the audience that didn't really care about these products to begin with. 
So that's my personal feeling. And if we do a video that's like that, it'll get it'll get more clicks. I feel like there are other people doing those kinds of videos right now and they do it better than Film Threat. So I'm happy to, sometimes I um, appear on other YouTube channels where I talk about those kinds of things. That's not the purpose of Film Threat. Our purpose and our mission is to support independent film. So we don't really talk about those topics too often on this channel. I mean, if they release a new Marvel movie, we'll talk about it. And we've done that, you know, mm -hmm. or a new Star Wars movie. If a new one comes out, we'll talk about that thing. But the general discussion of talking about how much we don't like it, I don't think that's productive after a while. I feel like I would be very depressed as a person if I, that's the only thing we talked about was though with those kinds of things, because the thing that keeps me sane is seeing independent film, seeing a movie like Hatched or a film like we met in virtual reality or these small indie movies. It gives me hope. It's like, it's like, um, it's like having my creative energy, like regenerated like batteries every year. Like Sundance is a reminder that, Hey, you don't have to just only watch these types of films. You don't only even have to pursue Disney, Marvel, Star Wars as a movie you'd like to make there. You can, you can tell a story about anything. So I am of the opinion that, that like, you know, keeping a balanced media diet, sure, watch your mainstream movies that are at the theater. At the same time, if you balance that with independent films as part of your complete media breakfast, you will not be as sad at the current state of Hollywood, which I think is garbage. I think most movies in Hollywood today are terrible. I think they're uh, developed by less experienced people where agenda trumps great storytelling and it's it's disheartening to see Hollywood unravel, you know. I mean, every hey, you know, Hollywood every once in a while will make something like, oh, this is really compelling. This is interesting. The sound of one man laughing also adds, all these products are bad, and they're all bad in the same way. It seems like they would be very they would be very little to say, but they talk about them for hours. I I agree with you, but there is there is I it's almost like here's what I my theory is because I've been on some of those shows and I actually personally enjoy them. I, so I know what you're talking about, but it's almost a form of group therapy. We've taken something beloved, nothing. I discovered on, on YouTube, you can look this up. Someone took the, created a 4K version of the original Rebel Assault on the Death Star from Star Wars and restored it back to when it was seen in 1977. And I saw that first run, 1977, I was about 11 years old. I was a little kid, right? Blew my mind. Right. I'm I mean, like I watch it on YouTube and I'm, it's recreated. I'm getting chills. This is the way it was originally presented. The sound mix isn't, uh, you know, changed from the special edition. The effects are not all digital. So I feel some of this is a form of group therapy. Additionally, I do believe that people in Hollywood are listening. I think that they're 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 starting now to listen. And there's an article you can Google this. It's called Hollywood's New Rules where it talks about, um, and Quentin Tarantino has been very vocal about this, about that agenda is now trumping storytelling and character. And I think that that's a bad thing. But I do think that part of the trend of YouTubers talking about these topics, of which I am one of those people, not on the Film Threat channel very often, but I am one of the people that will discuss this. I think it's a form of group therapy because really there is no reason why the Star Wars sequels should have been as bad as they were. Why isn't the first thing you're thinking, you're sitting down, you're J.J. Abrams, you're going to write the Star Wars sequels. The number one thing that has to happen is Luke, Han, and Leia have to reunite. They have to reunite in some form. They may only be in the first movie of the Star Wars sequels, hand it off. But the fact that those actors were alive when they made that movie and they didn't do that, I think is absolutely fucking criminal. And I think it's, I think it's awful. So anyways... Uh, the Sound of One Man Laughing, thank you for creating this as a topic here. I wish people talked about things they liked as Film Threat does. We do a balance with that. So thank you for that for that comment there. We do a balance. You know, we do a balance. Uh, we talk about things we like, but Alan and I, you know, we got to discuss. Actually, we debated. I, I hated the last, uh, the Matrix 4. Yeah, that, that's so, our so. biggest uh, our biggest video that we've done is the Matrix. Well, recently. It's speaking, over that. speaking of big properties and why that they we attracted so many people. Well, it deserved all the hate. It deserved all the hate. But, but, um, yeah. I mean, we try. I try to be. I'm, I'm a glass half full guy. So I'm, I'm very, um, 
you know, I, I, and, and interesting deleted scenes ad resurrection or last review is a blacklist script from 2019. So that's, that's great. But yeah, the group therapy, I do think it's a form of group therapy. There's no reason why, why that Star Wars, they ruined Star Wars. I mean, in my mind's eye as a kid, this is, I'm going to get, I'm going to put myself full screen so I could, in my mind's eye as a kid, I made up Star Wars adventures in my mind, playing with action figures. I, uh, granted, I'm 12, 13, whatever, I, through high school. In my mind's eye, I made up better stories than the sequels ended up being in my brain. And the long three years between when I discovered that the main protagonist, Luke Skywalker's father, was Darth Vader, and he had to basically kill his own father, the villain, at least in my head, I thought that's how you resolve that conflict. I, I, I was distraught. I mean, it was something I, I was obsessed about, read comics and novels and made up adventures. And I still have the die cast model, not here, but the die cast model, the Millennium Falcon that I got when I was a kid, and it's covered in dirt and I've never cleaned it. Because the cool thing about Star Wars toys, we never kept them in the in the box when we were kids. We took them out and they got dirty and awful and whatever. And so I, my feeling is that much of the discussion around this on YouTube, I think is useful because it's a form of group therapy because you're seeing these franchises destroyed, whether it's Terminator or Star Wars or Star Trek. These, these franchises are being utterly gutted and destroyed right before our eyes and the audiences that that grew up loving these things is seeing them destroyed and um this is maybe a topic for another stream but thank you for the sound of one man laughing and thank you uh uh you know uh funny girl i totally agree feel the same way chad p crawford says starting a slow clap and piers bronson agreed star wars sequels is incompetent mishandling of a cultural asset movie franchise probably maybe the the, the worst in our history so um, I don't know. It, I, I just feel it's criminal, like what happened to Star Wars. So I'll end by just saying, you know, contact us here at Film Thread, and you know what? Support us and buy something. You can wear a Film Threadist AF shirt. Uh, I, I liken it to Disney going into your bedroom, your toy chest, grabbing all your toys and screwing around with them. <laughs> Well, let's get Norm up for our next uh, <laughs> review because I know Norm Norm has to go. I saw in the private chat. Thank Sorry. you, Norm. All right. Apologies. Hey, um, before, you leave, before you leave, Norm, yeah. let everybody know your particulars. Horror buzz and all that stuff. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, yes. So uh, any of the, uh, the horror films that are being covered, I also cover them on, on Horror Buzz, my site, uh, and uh, bounce over here to cover pretty much anything else. On, on Film Threat, and yeah, so HorrorBuzz.com is the website. Uh, follow us on Instagram, at HorrorBuzz, Horror underscore Buzz on Twitter, and on Facebook, we have a Patreon, and so many more cool things coming. So uh, we just love, mm -hmm. we love movies, haunts, games, books, anything that's scary, well, from extreme to spooky. I'll just say, that's normally what you're supposed to do at the end before you leave. So do me a favor, we'll clip this, We'll clip the review, but we'll put that at the end before you leave. So we <laughs> oh, can just... I thought you were telling me to do my shit. No, I'm not telling you to leave. I'm glad you're here. Get... No, 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 no. I thought, I thought you were being like, okay, <laughs> tell me all I'm the all, things. Well, I'm like, I'm teasing, okay. I'm, I'm teasing you now. I just don't want you to forget before you leave. Tell us how people can find HorrorBuzz.com. Yeah, we'll just okay, repeat well, it just when we cut the clip. Horror when we clip it, we're just going to show the review. We'll put it at the end. This is our live stream. Anyways. <laughs> including this discussion we're having right now. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I've, I've got a movie to go to. Yeah, I know I'm you've got a movie to go to. Because you only have a five-hour window because this was the genius thing. I'm at the thing library that, right now. <laughs> this is the genius thing that the people at Sundance designed because I really wish they'd gotten – feedback from the community, you know, the filmmakers and the press covering this stuff, they, they, they might have designed this thing a little differently, but they're trying to make it like a festival. It's not going to be like the festival. Anyways, Norm, I, I have ranted long enough. Let's hear your <laughs> review of Emergency. Emergency. Oh, oh yeah. Man. yeah. Okay. That one was a lot of fun. It was, man, it was good. Uh, it was a, a short film that showed at Sundance back in 2018 and the director Carrie Williams and writer KD Davila uh, they they expanded it into a feature and for the most part it really works 
and it's really good. Uh, it's three three college students, uh, two uh, black guys and one Latino. They're all buddies. They're all they're all at a great college. They're all you know everything's cool, but. Uh, one of one of them says, "No, no, no. Okay, tonight before spring break, we've got to hit all the seven parties. We've got passes for all the seven parties, and we've got to make our legendary tour. And we've got to end up on the first wall. And we got this. Well, okay, cool. So uh, what happens is um, they they go back to their place and they come into their house because they're they're just picking up a few things. And oh my God, there's a drunk uh, white girl uh, passed out." on their floor and puking. And they're like, oh, we gotta, we gotta do something. We gotta call the police. And of course, one, one of the guys is like, no, we are brown and black. And, you know, standing over a white, white girl, uh, they're just gonna come for us, you know? And, and so it's this whole fear of reaching out to the police and trying to figure out uh, how to get this girl to safety who is she she's passed out she's drunk and it's kind of like in the, it's it's in the uh the genre of you know one crazy night you know type of a thing where it's just a farcical situation where they are trying to do right by this girl without getting into major trouble meanwhile people who know the girl are looking for her and there's this you know huge chase around town and they're following the girl because they have gps on her phone and you know i mean it's 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 funny but it makes boy does it make you think you know and uh it 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 really ends up proving a major point at the end and uh giving you a lot of a lot of stuff to leave the theater with to think about but so it's um, it's, a, it's a comedy with a moral dilemma Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely it's 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 freaking hilarious at times, and but also just like cringy because you're like, oh god, they're right. Like, I I I don't know what I would do in that situation. And the writing is so good because you're like, well, why don't they just? And then they do it, and then something happens, and then things are you know. So the the writing is super sharp. The the resolution draws out a little bit long than longer than it should, um, but uh, yeah, great great movie, and a lot of fun and um, yeah. So please 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 watch it. It's yeah, good. I saw it too, um, and I I really liked it. It's the he directed a um, hashtag R and J Romeo and Juliet last year. Um, and so I think it's interesting that Sundance brought, he came back with another film. He's part of the group. He's, you know, an insider, but, um, you know, he, the film, it's, it's so modernized for college life. And, mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was super interesting. Like th these parties, <laughs> I was like, I would love to have gone to a party like that. Like there's certain things in there. You're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Like he really like that plays it up. And I don't know if this was shot during the pandemic or not, but you definitely get a feel like it was a real deal film. Um, and he even filled in with sounds and, um, you know, and it was scary at times too. I thought like, you know, who's going to come after these guys, you know, guns in your face. And, you know, and, and then when you learn what you learn about the girl. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, so uh, you're, yeah. yeah. So uh, I good. you just need to watch it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, a good one. Damn good film. All right. That's nice. Kind of okay. Norm, you've got to leave. So can you give us your particulars? Once how do people again? find how do people find you? <laughs> oh, sorry. Find you? Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> or, or com, and you'll catch all of the reviews from uh Sundance horror movies over there as well. Uh, in addition to what's over here and uh, horrorbuzz.com, uh, we're on Facebook, Insta, Twitter, Patreon, all of that stuff. And that's that. Great. All right. Talk to you later this week. Take care. Also, see something in the dirt. See something in the dirt. That's also good. Something in the dirt. Okay, great. Okay. Awesome. See you later this week, Norm. Take care. Adios. Adios. Later. Bye. Uh, cool. So now uh, who, who's up? Who's up next? Yeah, let's see. Um. I don't know, Sabina. Do you want to talk about Cosby or not? Uh, um, I'm not ready yet. Um, okay, really? No, not ready. Not you, ready. There's um, a lot to digest. There is that a 
because um, I still have a little bit more to watch. Oh, um, okay. Four hours of stuff. And so I'm not ready, but I would throw something out very quickly about Brian and Charles. Um, okay. okay um, let's, uh, we'll get and, you set up with that. Here we go. Um, it's a Welsh film and it was what we've said earlier about why we love independent film festivals, because this is a quirky, eccentric, crazy film about a guy, an inventor who builds a robot who becomes human, but he's like an adolescent obnoxious teenager who's trying to learn and he learns really quickly and it's freaking hilarious. And this, the inventor, you know, drives his truck. He's got the disco playing and the light and he's super awkward. And he's got this soon to be girlfriend who's just as awkward. And then they're in this ancient Welsh village of stone homes, tiny, you got the cows, you got the sheep. Um, and then there's this bully family who like, you know, like, goes into town and, and forces people to give them free, knocks things over, and they want the robot. And they don't just want the robot because it's some fun little entity. They want to burn it. And so it's like this, it's hilarious. It is so inventive. And it's not a film that I think every, the world would see on the big screen because they wouldn't have access to it. But it's just refreshing um, because there's so much creativity that went into it. Jim Archer, the director, um, just knew what he was doing. I mean, and there's a lot of decor and timing and it, you know, a lot of like things you would never think about how a robot would work if it was sort of alive it, today. So like it's, its body is a washing machine and it's got like a, a blue light for one of its eyes. And so it's a little up to date, but not really. And also it's a mockumentary, which kind of goes in and out. So someone's filming him and he's talking back to the camera and then it kind of goes into the film and then it comes back um, and you just root for this geek inventor guy. Um, and Charles, the robot, um, like ends up leaving. <laughs> and um, I really liked it. Um, and I just thought it needed a plug because it is, it's one of those films I'm really glad Sundance chose to, sh to show it because these are people you don't know, you know, nothing about them. You don't know these actors and they did a great job. I, well, I love, I love, again, as we discussed earlier, I love indie sci-fi. I love that you can do something with it. Like a robots is a, is a, you know, I mean, that's like, you know, since the beginning of film history, right. With Very I mean, Metropolis, point. like uh, Fritz Lang's M Metropolis. I mean, it's robots have been an obsession, you know, uh, uh, recreations of humans, so to speak. The fact that they took it into a comedic direction is is interesting. But like any sort of indie sci-fi, I always find compelling. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have to run as well or no? I'm gonna stay a little bit. Um, I because I, I forgot we have five hour windows, and so we'll <laughs> so catch you up on the back end. Okay, cool. I do. <laughs> no, need I I do, need say, in, uh, I, do, I, do, I do need to bring in my special guest yeah. and we do need to end the stream probably about 315 or so. Okay. So uh, we've got limited time here for a couple more, maybe one more. Yeah, we week. actually only have one left. We only have yeah. one left. So who's doing that? That would be me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, this. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Can I just say about this? Uh, the director, her last film, her name is Shalini Kantaya. Uh, she, uh, uh, she, she is an amazing talent. She had a, um, she, she had a, a movie last year at Sundance, and I can't believe I'm spacing on it right now. Coded bias. Coded bias. That's right. It's actually coded bias is actually on Netflix. This is her kind of her follow up, which also is in the world of tech, and it's about TikTok. So. I, I'm saying I know everything about it and I haven't seen it, but I'm excited to hear what you think. Yeah. Alan. So what are your thoughts? I mean, this is an interesting documentary because uh, I'm out of the age range of TikTok, but I do have TikTok and I do watch all these food TikTok videos. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, um, yeah, this is this is pretty much a comprehensive history of TikTok, considering that it's only, what, how many years old? Maybe three or four years old. Um, but it just kind of goes, you know, sets the stage by saying, you know, this is an app that China had built uh, or a Chinese entrepreneur had built from China. And it's the first one to really break into the global market and take over basically uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter in terms of popularity and downloads. And, uh, and it really gets into not only 
you know how TikTok has been used to help people build and establish careers, become social media influencers, but it also looks at kind of the um, kind of the more the insidious and more political things, you know, like uh, um, like uh, you know when when one creator started to criticize China's uh, rounding up of Muslims and putting them in camps, mm -hmm. uh, TikTok uh, basically banned uh, took down those videos. And they suspended her account. You know, it's it's kind of the first example, hopefully the last example of a media company trying to silence and and censor voices. But you know, that's not ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then it gets into just how the app works and why it's so popular. The the for you page, and it it, it goes into the AI of it all. The fact that when you go through your for you page. All the videos you watch, it looks at how you, um, how long you watch a video, and then it starts to ramp up all these other videos, and so it now figures out what you like, and then pushes out those videos, and it gets to a scary point where if you think of something, why is it now all of a sudden that TikTok is getting you videos of the thing you just thought about? That's that's how crazy the conspiracy theory goes here. Um, then, uh, then it gets into a lot of the social media policies going on. We talked about the uh, the one girl who's who got banned from TikTok for for trying to be an activist. You know, found out that during the George Floyd protests, that TikTok was shadow banning anything with a hashtag BLM or George Floyd on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then there's privacy issues, and it goes through. Um, you know, there. Are, found out that there were children who was posting TikTok videos and then you had predators duetting those videos. And uh, and so it really goes comprehensive. It's not just about the phenomenon and the social aspect of it, but it now gets kind of behind the scenes into the programming behind it, the algorithm, uh, the policies. And then of course we have to always end a, a movie about Trump and how he wanted to ban TikTok uh, you know how it was how these pranksters had used TikTok to uh, to basically uh, befuddle one of his rallies, and how he got angry with it and, and threatened to ban it. And so um, it's you know I think it you know it I I just found it fascinating uh, and I and I like there's I wouldn't say it was ultra balanced but you know I think it was balanced enough to to really be informative and and um, you know kind of give you the backstory behind this this app that everyone's using oh you're muted yeah i you know i said that i'm i'm, I'm really fascinated to see this one just because mm -hmm. i really liked her last it's a well movie. done yeah yeah it's i well mean done. i really i liked the production value and just everything about um her last movie coded bias which is i believe still on netflix um really well done i i disagree with some of her premises um in 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 coded bias but but i but i i admire that like i really feel like technology has such a huge impact on all of our lives now it's literally changed everything that we do that it has to be a topic that should be discussed more and more because you know whether it's you know how it impacts teens like how it and, and especially with tiktok right like it's so it's so popular. I mean, my understanding is is that you have a TikTok, Alan. I mm. don't know if you want to. Oh, it's Arthur Farty. I don't really do anything on it. So. You don't really do anything on Arthur <laughs> Farty. <Yeah. laughs> but, uh... It sounds like you do. <laughs> it sounds like you, you know. Do. It, it's just so much involved in it. And you know, honestly, the documentary brings up the the impact <laughs> social media has had on content creators on their mental health and it's like oh is this a road i want to go down it's like, right right can i just play video games and stream it i mean that's all i really want to do yeah yeah well yeah but that one is that was definitely at the top of my list because i really enjoyed her last film it's, um it's a know. great discussion i mean if you if you want to get a comprehensive of of the role of social media is playing in society and whether it's good for us or not this is a good documentary to watch yeah, I well, I first of all, I think it's a double edged sword. I think that yeah. like social media has clearly helped in some ways and it's created and opened a Pandora's box of problems we didn't even know that we had. So it's it's just kind of disheartening to see 
you know, like these new problems not being addressed. I mean, and this is going to sound maybe super hard line for me, but when you look at all the problems it creates with teenagers, I, I almost think you have to go no one under the age of 18 using social media. I mean, if my kids were of a certain age, there is no way that they would be allowed to be on social media in any yeah. way under the age of 18. When you hear the horror stories, it's shocking to me. I mean, we didn't know a lot about smoking, right? Like, uh, my doctor recommends rubber. Like, yeah. you know, doctors were recommending in the 50s and 60s that you you smoke a pack of cools, right? Like, yeah. it's so utterly ridiculous that we didn't know, and clearly things have changed. I think that, yeah, like... Oh, I was gonna say the, the the saddest thing is there's one influencer they they bring in, mm -hmm. and um, there's a point where she, where she's so mentally stressed out and anxiety ridden right. that the advice they gave her was just get off of it, just stop doing your TikToks. And then her response was the saddest of all. It was her family. She and her family rely on her income from TikTok to support Ugh. herself. Ugh. Ugh. That's horrifying. It's horrifying. Well, look, I'm dying to see that doc. And it's also a subject that I think I, I hope that Shalini, um, the director, continues to explore. I think it's I think it's, you know, I don't know. Uh, and 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 uh, Beamers 417 says nine out of 10 doctors prefer camel non filters. So Back in the day, you could see print ads, <laughs> in old nope. magazines. You could see print ads where doctors recommend you know, ah, my doctor smokes these. Like it's, you know, so look, we don't know the long-term effects of social media. It's really, and you can look at, when you look at like self-harm among teenagers, mm -hmm. you, you see that it dramatically begins to go to, to rise when iPhones became affordable. Mm -hmm. When the iPhone became affordable, that is when you, you saw the self-harm among, among teenagers, especially teen girls you know, like, like went up. So um, yeah. uh, it's, uh, just right. says it's good that they address the economic impact of TikTok. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I don't know. There are just so many unintended consequences of all of these things. I feel like we're living in, in sort of a, almost a science fiction time here, but we're wrapping up on our, on our, our reviews. Now we will be back later this week. Um, hopefully Wednesday at 1 PM mm -hmm. in the afternoon we'll be, or, Wednesday at one. I don't know. We'll yeah, figure that it out. Yeah, would now. be our last, our last Sunday. And yeah, probably. Thursday we'll do a, maybe Thursday. Maybe we'll do it Thursday and we'll wrap up because that's I think the last day of Sundance. Okay. We'll wrap it up uh, then. But to uh, to to end today's live stream, I want to bring on a special special guest, my friend, longtime friend, Dan Mervish here from from the slam, one of the founders of Slam Dance. Yay! Um, an incredible. Yay. Hey, Dan, how's it going? Hey, great, Chris. Nice to see you. I've been listening to the show all afternoon. You guys do an amazing job. Uh, great. Oh, my God. Are you, wearing this new, are you wearing a new movie show t-shirt? Oh, my God. <laughs> what? Look at Look that. At that. And it's like That's covered crazy. What are, what are the odds that I'd be wearing this? <laughs> this was, it was one of my first experiences in television. I did a show for FX called The New Movie Show with Chris Gore. Thankfully, they uh, cast me as the host. Um, someone also named Chris Gore, the same name as the show. So it, 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 it all worked out. Uh, yeah. We're going to, we're, but Dan, I just want to have you here because, um, and of course, I think, you know, you know, Alan Ng and, and Sabina. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I know oh, Sabina. Nice yeah, to meet hi, you. Dan. I know Alan. I'm hi, a friend Dan. of Skizzes, by the way. You're what? <laughs> I'm a friend of Skizzes. Oh, well, every, who is it though? Yeah. 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 He has a new film. Of course. He has a new yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, no, but I want to bring we Dan need I want to bring Dan on to just talk about like what's happening in the world now. We're now, this is our second year of a virtual Sundance. Um, it's, it's, you know, are we going to go into a third year? I've tried to argue very passionately. I tried to argue that maybe they should consider moving things to the spring, summer. I just wanted to get your thoughts on just like the festival world as a whole, where we're going, what's happening. Um, uh, you know, you do have some perspective. I knew, know you still have a connection to slam dance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you tend to like, what are your just sort of general thoughts on where we are in, in the world of festivals? Well, I, I, I just wrote an article in that was in variety last week that kind of goes into one aspect of it, which is that I, I think there's been a, and this kind of predates the pandemic, but the pandemic kind of accelerated it, which is that, 
you know, the, the dis- quote unquote discovery festivals, Sundance and to a lesser degree Slam Dance and then South by and then Tribeca are in a pretty narrow window of the calendar. They're, they're from January to, you know, May. It's basically the, the, the early spring. Um, and then the industry and, and the, pr- the press and media, they pay attention to new films by new directors then. Uh, or not, or new films by old directors then. But then for about eight months, they, even though there's plenty of festivals, there's, as we know, there's thousands of festivals out there. Most of the big high profile festivals during that time, anytime after May and into the fall, into the summer, into the fall, are so hyper focused on the award season. And, and oh, what's the Oscar buzz? And how many Oscar winners can we, you know, have? or potential Oscar winners can we have at our festival this year? And glad. what? how can Toronto, you know, take more premieres than Venice? And how can Telluride compete with Toronto? And it's and it's really all about the, the festival, or sorry, about the awards films. And of course, those films, obviously some great films there, but they already have distribution. They already have, uh, you know, marketing. They're already awards contenders. So, and most of them have big stars in them. The, so the problem is if you have a new film that wants to come out or premiere at a festival in the fall or the summer, it's r- impossible to get any kind of real oxygen, even though there's some great festivals during those times. So what I think, and this really dovetails to what you were saying yesterday, is that um, the festival calendar just really needs to be spread out and kind of rethought. And 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 COVID is giving us a chance to do that. Uh, because I agree with you. I think Sundance itself is not sustainable as a January festival. You don't need to be an epidemiologist to, to know that every, you know, th- if you have a festival at 8,500, you know, feet high in the winter, three weeks after New Year's Eve, and expect people from all over the world to come. Some of them are going to be sick, and they're and the re- and everyone else is going to get sick too. So, um, so I think first and foremost, I think I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Sundance should change their dates, and and you know, March, November. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me when, but they can go whenever they want because they're the biggest festival, at least in North America. So more power to them. You know, go where you want, and and Park City would appreciate that. They they don't necessarily like having Sundance in in January because they take up all the all the the ski condos and you know that's bad for business so Sundance would or or Park City would much prefer if it was in you know spring or summer well I'm I'm just so pleased that someone of of your stature actually agrees (laughs) with me on this because I mean look you're an expert in your own right you've been involved in festivals and uh producing directing writing films um, and being a part of the indie film scene since the 90s also, and an author and an yeah. author. There you go. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it does sort of befuddle me. I don't often get to use the word befuddle, but I'm going to say that word. Um, that why, why is there not a, a conversation about this? Because flu season will never go away. Flu season is now COVID season. It's not going away. I, have, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to Sundance or in Park City Slam Dance, come back. I'm sick almost for like sometimes 10 days, two weeks after. It's like that, you know, your energy because it is a grind. It's a marathon. You know, four hours of sleep a night, you're drinking emergency, you're 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 not catching a full meal, you're eating like chicken skewers at some uh, event, you know, you're living on appetizers, you know, not because you can't afford food, it's just the, it's a time thing, right? Like yeah. a sit-down meal is is tough to grab unless you plan your schedule right. I like to keep a fairly open schedule, but it's, it's, I wonder if there's, I mean, it would throw everything off, right? Because Sundance does set the tone. A lot of, a lot of festival directors come to, to Park City looking for movies to program and Slamdance is in the mix. Slamdance has my heart. You know that, Dan. Yeah. Slamdance has my heart because it's like a, it's like a punk rock. I, I feel like it's almost like Slamdance is like a track that, if Sundance had balls, they would just make Slam Dance a thing. They would they would make it part of the. But I just love the support that Slam Dance has for the the indie film community, and and it, it has its own flavor. Like sometimes we even see a movie, and they're like, oh, that's a Slam Dance movie, you know, right? There's this whole vibe to it. But I don't know why there's not this thinking because this could very well get canceled again next year and three years in a row. Think of the lost revenue for the city, right? 
if you if you sort of like look, it's already ski season anyways, right? So that's not going away. But I've been to Park City in the summer. It's gorgeous. Everywhere you look, it's a postcard. There's no reason you couldn't. I think it would change the vibe. It would be really cool. I don't know why that's not something that's in consideration. Um, so what? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they are. I wouldn't be surprised if they are starting to think about it. I mean, look, they've got their hands full this week, obviously. So they're not, you know, they're just focusing on on their immediate issues. But I, I think, you know, in in three weeks, when when the festivals are over, if they're not talking about it, I I would be sh shocked. Um, I, there was there was an interesting interview with Tabitha Jackson, who's one of the main people at, at Sundance, uh, like three days ago, where she she said she was talking about like, oh, what what could they have done? Because obviously they've gotten a lot of grief for making their decision to cancel the live so late in the game, uh, and that's that's a whole other issue. And and she said that they thought about postponing it to later in the spring, but that it would mess up everyone else's schedules. Uh, other festivals and and i can see why that would be a consideration for this year immediately like uh, it, it's just logistically hard to, right, to right. postpone anything but i think moving forward sundance has to has to own the fact that they're the biggest you know festival in 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 the country and in in north america and they should they can go wherever the hell they want and they should they should just make their own decision and then every and if south by has to move or tribeca has to move great let them Fine. move. It's look, the care. world exactly. The world has already been disrupted, right? The world yeah. has already been disrupted. Why not disrupt this? And absolutely they could, even, they could even do a trial festival, do a four-day summer Sundance with maybe make it a best of just as a trial. Do it this summer. Um, you know, make it four to six days or something. Look, I love when they uh, when they will close off parts of Main Street, like sort of at the bottom of Main Street, you know, they'll close it off for like a block yeah. and have like a block party. There are ways to do it. They could test some outdoor screenings, do a trial run this, this summer, uh, just to, just like a, like a four day, like a long weekend, right? Just to test, test the logistics, test doing it in the summer. Can they attract people? Can they get people driving in from Salt Lake? Maybe someone like myself might drive in from, from the West coast, who knows? But but I, I think that I think that it's got to be thought about it because flu season's never going away. As someone who finally figured out, maybe I should get a flu shot every year, and I <laughs> finally began to get a flu shot. Yeah. Um, I think it was on 2004. I got really, really horrible pneumonia. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so yeah, it's something that really needs to be considered. I just think that like, you know, positives from this are the virtual festival. Clearly, people have been responsive to that. Can it be better? Yes. And and earlier in our conversation, we 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 talked about some things that could be could be made better when it comes to virtual. But like changing the calendar, consider it. Consider it Sundance. You know, um, I'm sure Tabitha Jackson doesn't even know who we are, uh, Film Threat or myself. But like consider it. Um, couple couple. I want to get to some comments quick, and we'll continue our conversation. Sure. Funny girl. Bye. Funny girl says. Hey to all, as it is almost, as it almost midnight here, I have to leave. Topic is interesting, but it's late for me. See you in the next okay. uploads. Bye. Chad P. Crawford says, Dan's hat is on another level. Um, Chad also says, Sundance has nothing to lose in trying some of these ideas, it seems. And uh, I'm going to butcher your name, Sujua, and I'm, my apologies. Uh, so one day I will learn your name. I will learn your name, Sujua. Uh, a guy who's become a great friend on on social media and our, our correspondence is living on app appetizers is a good title for a movie about indie filmmaking. And yeah. our earlier conversation, Sujua says, teens and film directors should stay off social media. Parentheses, directors can avoid negative review links and comments better for mental health. I think just, I don't use social media as much as I used to. I really just use it to promote. I use uh, social media mostly professionally to promote things I'm doing. I really don't use it on the regular. Occasionally I'll say something snarky um, or incendiary for fun, but I don't use social media nearly as much as I used to. It's just, I find it not particularly productive. I prefer to like work on projects, but Dan, what else? We talked about the Slam Dance Film Festival, you know, yeah. um, Earlier in our conversation, we were talking about, um, and let me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to, I have to edit this because we're, we got to, we got to, we got to get into a slam dance discussion. 
Um, but uh, you are one of the Dan Mervish. You are one of the founders of Slam Dance, and I Slam, am indeed. Slam Dance has it's a it's a it's the punk rock spirit of Park City. When Slam Dance is there, Slam Dance is also does year round events in other cities, additionally screenings in the Los Angeles area, or they used to at the Arclight Cinemas in Hollywood when that was around. But um, what's what's up with Slamdance now? I, I'm aware of a couple of the films that are playing there. Uh, I happen to see, this is kind of a preview. We'll talk about this later in the week when we pivot to Slamdance. I saw Mark Pellington's The Severing, which is absolutely amazing film, indescribable, kind of a dance experimental, um, just bizarre uh, experience. But what are your thoughts on Slam Dance this year? And I know also you have a movie coming out soon, 18 and a half. So let's basically this segment called Catching Up with Dan. Yeah, let's, yeah, there let's, you go. let's put you front yeah. and center here. Catching there up with right that there again. There, there we are. <laughs> and then hang on a second. Is there a film threat quote? Yeah, are we on, on there? Poster? Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. You made a poster. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and as Chris is old enough to remember, I have had a film threat quote on every poster for every film I've ever made. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, even the bad ones. So, uh, no, I, um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's always an honor to have film threat on there. And, and um, yeah, so we, uh, so where should I start? Uh, Slam Dance, yeah, so we're starting in a few days and, um, and it's uh, like Sundance, it's, it's all virtual this year um and, and like sundance we would love i mean uh, and by the way if if sundance did move to another part of the year we would just move with them and that's fine in the same way that when can shifted a few months last year directors fortnight and critics week just shifted with them and that's you know that's just what you do um and honestly it would be it would just be easier for us too because you know logistically it's a it's a pain to to put on a festival at the, in you know, at the height of ski season, it's just everything's way more expensive then. Um, so yeah, Slam Dance starts soon. Um, you know, it really hasn't changed much. It's it's still. I mean, it's, it'll be virtual, but you can buy a pass for ten dollars, which is just right. ridiculous. You can. It's like insanely cheap. Um, it's going to be part of something starting called the Slam Dance Channel, which I don't know much about, but it's. Very exciting. It'll be a set top box thing to do year round screenings of things, but it's kind of, we're launching it with this year's festival. But, um, but in terms of the quality of the festivals and the kinds of uh, the quality of the films and the kinds of films, the narrative and documentary competitions, all first time directors, no distribution uh, in, in place, um, low budgets. Uh, we also, something people forget is we mix and match the Americans with the international people, which is, which is different than a different approach in Sundance. So, I mean, we showed Bong Joon-ho's first film, you know, back in 2000 or something, and it was showing right next to like films from Iowa. And, and we continue to do that. We have a South Korean film this year. Uh, we have a Polish film and a Macedonian film, things like that, like along with the the American films. Um, and then we also have the section called Breakouts, which is for not first time directors. So that's kind of our out of competition section. So so Mark Pellington's film is part of that. Um, so yeah, but it's uh, and then a million shorts and different and all kinds of shorts and things like that. But we you know and Slam Dance is our you know the the thing about us is that you, you may not see a film uh, unlike our friends down the the hall at the, or down the down the hill at Sundance where a lot of the films already have distribution and you're going to see them in a month or whenever our films you may never see them somewhere else um but you may hear about those direct you may see those directors some other time so and and you know as as you know i mean we were the film that we were the festival that showed the first films of bong joon ho christopher nolan ryan johnson the russo brothers uh the late lynn shelton um you know lena dunham uh, uh the safety brothers uh, sean baker you know and, and a lot of these people came back then as alumni and jurors and things like that so um so that's that's the funny thing is is yeah you'll you'll see the first film of people that you are definitely going to see their their last film too eventually um but yeah but as far as the kinds of films we picked uh, that's the same this year we we just made the decision a few weeks earlier than sundance that we were going to go virtual we kind of we i don't know for whatever reason we saw the writing on the wall a little sooner than they did about omicron but um 
Uh, but look, as for me, I've been playing live festivals. I, uh, you know, we finished 18 and a half in September, uh, premiered it at the Woodstock Film Festival. I, I've dubbed the term uh, trough fests, which are festivals that take place in the troughs between Omicron spikes. So my film uh, played between the Delta and Omicron spikes, and then it's going to play again between Omicron and, I don't know, Parallax or whatever the next spike is going to be. Um, so just today, and Chris, I can, I can break the news right here, uh, our UK premiere is going to be at the Manchester Film Festival in on March 18th. Um, and that was just announced today. So um, so we're, and that'll be a live festival. They're planning it live. And that's the interesting thing is I, is as a filmmaker, I can kind of gauge where other festivals are year round in a, in a different way than, you know, if you're just running a festival, you're kind of, you know, just insulated uh, from yourself. And I can see the festivals starting in March and April are going to be live again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, they're already planning, um, you know, those festivals, depending on wherever they are in the world, um, they're going to be live again then. And, but yeah, but January, you know, you don't have to be an epidemiologist to know which way the wind blows. That's 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 always going to be a spike of something. So yes, I'll say I'm not like, a doctor, but flu season is pretty much the same every year, and it's right yeah. around. Right around. No, and yeah. I'm not a doctor, but as you know, I sleep with one frequently, and that's, um, you're married to one. Oh, that's it. That's I knew it was something like that, and I can <laughs> tell you that flu season is remarkably predictable. It's and, it's, so, um, it's 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 so weird because. I've even been to, to Sundance in, in Park City where one of our writers was down for the count and actually had to go see a doctor. Like that's how, yeah. like it's just, that's when it happens. You have people flying in. I just think that the way to solve this problem forever is to move the festival. I think a trial run in 2022 this summer, um, if anyone from Sundance is listening, like just try it. Just do a, yeah. you know, any anyone. So, I mean, I mean, why a slam dance could do it? You don't need permission from Sundance to do what you do. I know that slam dance kind of is like on the heels of um, Sundance, but I don't think yeah. you need permission. I think if you did it, no. I think the city. I think you could actually own the city if you did it without the permission of Sundance, right? Like, I feel like slam dance could do that. So some something I would just love because that that I I, I was fortunate to go to um, Park City once in the summer. And it's beautiful where the street was, the bottom of the street was closed off. And it's sort of a, it's almost like a beer fest. And it's, it, it's a blast. I mean, it's a whole other experience. You've been there during the summer. It's a whole other experience. So um, I'd like to see them try it. Uh, I, I hope that uh, the powers that be are listening. And I intend to take full credit if it does happen. If it does Absolutely. happen, I will, no, me I too. Will, I'll take a full credit. I'll say I called it and Dan called it second. And that's what I'm gonna <laughs> now. What is the what is the status of 18 and a half? I know you're successfully playing festivals now. What's yes. the status? So yeah, so we are uh, we're in the process of negotiating some distribution deals. So um, that is going to happen. Um, I can tell you it will most likely come out commercially um, and probably theatrically. Uh, at the end of June, um, which just between you and me and and the four of us here is the 50th anniversary of the Watergate um, break-in. So that seems to be the time to put out a Watergate-related film, which ours is. Um, so we're kind of gearing up for that. And uh, all kinds of fun things are going to happen. I've been working on a soundtrack album and, and things like that coming out. Um, so, and yeah, we have a bunch of festivals coming up in, in the springtime and, you know, I mean, partially by design and partially by luck, we made a point of playing at live festivals at Woodstock, at Tallgrass, at Anchorage and Sao Paulo in Brazil and Gijon in Spain, while everyone else was waiting around for Sundance and the industry was waiting around and the, and the, and the press not you guys, but other press were just, oh no, we're not going to cover Woodstock this year. Why? We're going to wait for Sundance. And if you didn't get into Sundance, you must suck. And it's like, guys, there's a pandemic going on. We are going to go, as if another filmmaker friend of mine said, go where the love is. If there's an audience, go there and be nimble and, you know, go where you can go. And, and festivals are making decisions at the last minute. And as filmmakers, you just have to roll with that. And the problem with the kinds of films that are at Sundance is the ones that already have the big distribution and the big distributors on board or the big reps is 
they told those filmmakers, no, don't go to any fall festivals, you know, wait six months, wait eight months for Sundance. And then all of a sudden those filmmakers are crestfallen. They don't, they didn't get a live premiere. And the ones that already have distribution lined up for next month, they're never going to have a live screening. Now, oddly enough, the, the filmmakers at Sundance and Slamdance that don't have distribution in a weird way, they're, they're going to be okay. They will have live screenings because what what will be interesting to me is that is which of the spring festivals, the spring regional festivals are going to really capitalize and say, hey, why don't we just show a whole bunch of Sundance and Slamdance films and, and that'll be their live premiere. And those filmmakers are going to eat that up. So whether that's Dallas or, or Florida or Sarasota or Omaha or San Luis Obispo, like, you know, I mean, you guys know there's a lot of really great festivals in the spring that are quote unquote regional festivals. Well, those guys are going to step up in a big way because they can, they now have their pick of any of those Sundance films. Um, so I think yeah. that'll be the interesting thing moving forward is which of the, which of those live festivals in, in March and April and May are really going to uh, take advantage of all these Sundance films and filmmakers that are kind of floundering now. Well, look, the world is is disrupted. The festival world, world is disrupted. And if there's one thing I do know that filmmakers uh, are good at dealing with, it's adversity. So we roll with the punches. We're going to be wrapping up the stream here in just a few minutes. Um, but Dan, I, I really, uh, I want to go around and get everybody's, we didn't do this last time we did our live stream. We'll be doing another live stream later this week to wrap up slam dance and then we'll do another live stream about slam dance so please come back look for those notifications subscribe to the film threat youtube channel set the notifications and the bell so you know when we go live you'll you'll be able to jump in whether you're i've listened to live streams in my car when i'm driving sometimes i don't i don't post comments but i do listen um but i want to thank dan mervish dan uh, my friend of god since the 90s uh from being here for being here and yeah and he still has a t-shirt free t-shirt i gave him 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. I know, ago. we use it for pain well used, and things yeah. like that. It's a little schmutzig, but good, it's- Good, uh, good. I have, I have some old t-shirts like that. I have a t-shirt used well. That, oh my God, I have a t-shirt that Richard Linklater gave me years ago for the movie Slacker. I still have it wow, from the, that's from the early 90s. But Dan, so where can people find you on social media and find out information about where your film 18 and a half is screening? Uh, on, on, on the Twitter and the Facebook and the Instagram, I'm usually at Dan Mervish. Um, 18 and a half is typically at 18 spelled out and a half movie. Um, and, uh, uh, or, or just my website, danmervish.com. And, um, that's the easiest way to, to find me and, and, and see what, what other interesting festivals around the world I'm going to be going to, because I have fun with my films. I like to go to fun <laughs> places. Like, you are, you're such a ringmaster when it comes to the marketing <laughs> of your movies. And I really put it that way. You're a showman. And, and, I, and I love that, not just from the unique hats, but also just yeah. the way that you market a movie, you make it, it's not just a movie, it's like a movement. So I, I, I yeah, like, if my, if my yeah. Q&A isn't as long as my movie, I'm, I'm not successful, you know? <laughs> And, 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 you know, and it's tough because we've been getting protesters at every one of our screenings, uh, pro Nixon protesters keep showing up mysteriously. So, uh, look, I, I'm a little worried that they're going to find us in at the spring festivals too. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen the photos on social media, but, um, Dan, thank you for being here. I will no, wrap thank up. You. Thanks for having me. Don't, don't leave Sabina. Um, you're Forging ahead, next time we do our live stream, you're going to have a review of the four-hour Cosby documentary, <laughs> oh, yeah. among, among other stuff. But where can people find you on social media? I'm at S. Dana P. and Sabina Dana Plassi, um, and that, that's pretty much it. Um, and I just want to say, Dan, you know, there's one thing I love about Slam Dance is it, it always feels like home. Every year I've ever gone, I, oh. I love how I get treated there. I love how I get honored there. And each year that I've reviewed films for Slam Dance, I just, it's the art, the artists that, you know, they're, you know, it's, there's, there's, it's clean and fresh and, you know, it's what you really want. It's down and dirty too. And I love it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, my colleague, editor in chief, yes. Alan Ng. Yeah, I'm all over the place. Uh, Twitter is uh, my pal Al. We already talked about TikTok being Arthur Party. <laughs> I should also say I, the Nixon Library is literally just down the road from my house, so you should you should try to. They have a theater. You should try to get the film in there. Yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll see about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
And I'm uh, we're film thread on everything. Instagram, TikTok, look up film thread. I am that Chris Gore on everything. And I just want to say to everyone, great stream. She says, Piers Bronson says thanks. And Piers also, I think Piers actually said, Piers bought a shirt. Was it Piers who bought some shirts? Oh, I think, I think no, somebody I think. said that. So thank you for that. Chad P. Crawford, who we uh, said, thanks for all you do. You aid the new next generation of filmmakers. Thank you for that. David Garcia says, just saw the Jamie Wolf key art for Slamdance 22, and it's great. Yes, all that. And um, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone in the chat here. We'll be doing a couple more live streams later this week about Sundance and Slamdance. So join us for that. Subscribe to the channel. Click that bell for notifications. And, and share, like. And share and like these live streams. We're going to be doing more live streams in 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 you know 2022. So thank you for that. Piers Bronson is taking us out with your welcome film threat. And Sujua says films can be any length, even four hours. Sabina, <laughs> well, that'll be a debate for another time. Sujua, uh, I'm and, and Piers Bronson. Thanks for the stream and all you do. We do appreciate that. Uh, take care, everyone. Check out these indie movies when they come out. And goodbye to you all. Take care, everyone. Later. Bye. Bye. Wait, what am I saying? I got to do. Wait, what am I doing? Hey, I got to find the. I got it, Alan. Don't worry. I got it. Here we go. All right. Take care, everyone. Later. Later.